Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Select Board meeting. Tonight is September 24th, 2019. We're airing on Comcast Channel 22 and Verizon Channel 23. Uh, on tonight's agenda, we'll have liaison reports, town manager report, and public comment. We'll then have a presentation from Arts Reading. Uh, we'll be having a discussion on Airbnb and absentee owners. We'll also have a presentation um, to have an update from the Climate Advisory Committee. Um, John, or excuse me, uh, Mark and Andy will be presenting from the Economic Development Committee subcommittee on their recent work. We'll have a discussion on new crossing road development and the town manager evaluation process. The hearing scheduled for 9 o'clock on the liquor license has been canceled. So we'll move to the select board alcohol policy presented by John, and uh, then a discussion on select board goal settings, future agendas, and minutes. So with that, we'll start with the ASN reports, Andy. Sure. Um, it was a busy couple of weeks, but I'll just narrow it down to three um, things that I did. On the 11th, I attended a meeting of the Wakefield Board of Assessors, where they discussed the Tarrant Lane project. Um, the tentative schedule is to uh, approve the project at their next meeting, or not their next meeting, the, the, the meeting after next on October 9th. And uh, once work begins at the project, the developers expect to um, the project to take about, take about 32 to 36 months. This initiative includes representatives, representatives from more than 20 cities and towns, as well as a number of private groups, including Mothers Out Front. Um, I met with several of our counterparts at the at the meeting. There were other selectmen, select board members, and city councilors, um, and was able to uh, talk with them. And there, the town managers and DPW directors were represented as well. The meeting was very informative. Uh, in the packet, there is uh, they handed out an assessment of gas safety in Massachusetts. <laughs> which um, reinforced my dedication to the Warren article that Vanessa and I have sponsored uh, at our last meeting for November town meeting. I, I'd like to attend the October 15th regional meeting with National Grid. This is, um, it's going to be a cooperative meeting. You know, they're establishing a working relationship with National Grid. And um, I'd like to attend that as representative, representative of this board. Uh, I, I want to make it clear I won't be signing any deals or negotiating anything. I'll probably just mostly be listening as we're early on in the process. But um, I was wondering if that's something the board would uh, be comfortable about. Sure. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, last one, uh, and perhaps the most exciting one. Um, honorable mention tonight goes out to two staff uh, members, Kim Honeschlager and Chuck Tyrone, who donated their expertise and their day off on Saturday to help construct a bridge over the mighty Abergiorna as it flows through Reading. Um, we, we, a bunch of us got together last Saturday. Um, I joined Kim and Chuck, the Trails Committee, and a number of other volunteers. We worked from about 10 to 4. Their planning and execution of the project was <coughs> perfect, uh, except when I was involved. And um, the bridge is going to be uh, part of that new trail we approved uh, within the Mallet Conservation um, land that will allow people to walk from Lowell Street uh, at the point across Intervale and from Willow Street, just north of the railroad tracks or northeast, to Hunt Street, which is um, quite a nice walk. It's beautiful in there. And the, the, the bridge that they built, or, or we built, is, it, is really, um, really nice. I encourage you, strongly encourage you to volunteer. It's fun. And um, also to use our, the trails in Reading. There's a lot more nature in, in Reading than you think. So that's it. Thank you. So uh, last Wednesday, I attended the downtown district management kickoff meeting. There were more than 100 attendees that came. Um, it was a great event. There were a lot of folks that came to talk about what they'd like, what their vision is for downtown. Um, very uh, well run by, by all the folks involved. Um, there is a survey that uh, I believe is still up for another couple weeks. 
to three weeks even, called Reimagine Reading. You can find it by going to the town website, and it asks you a series of questions about what you would like to see in the downtown. We'd encourage you to fill that form out. Thanks very much. Okay. John? Um, in the category of um, public safety and good neighbors, um, I was present when um, uh, when Chief Clark, uh, Lieutenant Amadola, um, Sergeant Martell, and Officer Cravens all visited Reading Rifle and Revolver for the, at their annual meeting. Um, and the, the purpose of their visit was to send a thank you, um, deliver a thank you in person, and present a plaque from the police department for the many years that um, that range has been made available locally for our police to come down and do their work, do their training. Um, and, you know, the members were a little blown away, frankly. Um, they were pleasantly surprised to have that kind of a formal thank you um, from the police department. And I thought that it was really well placed. Um, I, one of the things that was discussed as, as part of that thank you visit was a range that um, the club has been working on in concert with conservation. Um, a tactical range actually that the, our police department will be able to go down and use on a regular basis and avoid travel avoid expense um, it's kind of the good neighbor thing and it was nicely done it's been nicely done by the club for many years and it was really thoughtful of uh, of the police department who came you know chief and lieutenant amadola and all their uh, firearms instructors actually came along so it was nicely done that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'll focus my liaison report tonight on uh, the Human Relations Advisory Committee. Although they're an advisory committee to us, um, they have asked for our advice on how to proceed on a particular matter. So um, they are now at uh, a state such that their their membership is such that all all four members need to be present to establish a quorum, and they have been unable to. Um, confirm a quorum for their meetings and so they have been unable to conduct business and the one major item that they need um, to to that they would like to accomplish and that they have historically accomplished is planning the MLK day celebration um, but they are unable have been unable in recent months to meet in a quorum so are unable to appropriate funds and plan which I, I understand uh, tend to be less than one hundred or two hundred dollars, but they've been able to unable to conduct the business necessary to get that underway. And so they were looking uh, to us for advice back to them how how they should proceed. Um, is it is this something that town they ask? Is this something that town staff might be able to take on? Um, what our thoughts are. So uh, for clarification. Uh, Andy, I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, uh, Lord. Uh, A-Track falls under our policies, correct? Yes, they're established within our policies. Okay. Um, as far as reaching quorum, if they don't have the members to reach quorum. So they're, a, they're technically board of seven, but with actually four appointed members because um, so uh, school committee member Elaine Webb has recently resigned, and so now they are down a member. So, so they now need four. all four. four. I, I, I believe they, they need four people to meet, but they're now down to four people total. So they have to get everybody. They have to get everybody and have been unable to, to do that. Is the committee too large from the standpoint of slots? Is that, could that be a short-term assistance mm. to them? I mean, in other words, if we move that to five members mm -hmm. and now they had three, mm -hmm. they'd have a quorum. Mm -hmm. And What's in that? the short term, you know, I mean, I mean, as more people would be interested, we could hold those the opportunity to readjust that to a larger committee and that just seems like a logical way to solve that's, the problem short term mm -hmm. i agree that's where i was going because if it's in the policies it's just, it's fairly easy for us to adjust okay um do we need a hearing for that we yeah. would 
Yeah, okay. we can, um, I'll try to get in touch with Josh, yeah, the chair. Okay. I know he travels a lot. You know, yes, um, yes. Um, um, see if so that works for them short term. Okay. If, if they'd be interested in that, we could do that on a temporary basis. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got a, we do have a hearing planned for policy two weeks from tonight. Right. Can we piggyback? Yeah. They're three weeks from tonight. Yeah, I think so. If we can piggyback on that, you know, we could maybe solve that problem in time for them to get together and get their business done, yeah. you know, for okay. the MLK celebration. So from a next steps perspective, Ed, are you comfortable coordinating with them to see if yes. that would be, if they would be yes, interested I can in do that approach? Coordinate with yeah. Bob and, and then Josh. Bob and, and, okay. Very good. So if we need to add that to the agenda, then mm -hmm. let's do that. Okay. Just a Thank quick you. question. Do they have potential members in mind? Just to take a flip side of the same coin. To, to build up to seven? No. Okay. Um, at a, f a couple meetings ago, I had mentioned they're looking for additional members. I think they're they're of the view, or at least some of their membership is of the view that um, they'll f follow the lead of the work of the ad hoc committee at this point, which seems to be moving forward. So. Thanks. Uh, well, for those of you here in the audience, we have a packed house tonight, which is nice to see. Uh, or for those of you at home, if you're interested in joining uh, HRAC, the Human Relations Advisory Committee, please reach out. You can find the application online, um, or you can call, contact any of us, or reach out to the uh, town staff, and they can direct you appropriately. All right, so um, I attended the Finance Committee meeting. Um, there was a discussion on retirement costs, as well as unused override funds. Capital was revisited, uh, and also sustainable efforts in town projects. Uh, I also attended the Climate Advisory Committee. They're actually going to be presenting later on today. Um, and Mark and I attended the football game a couple of weeks ago. Um, it had a special ceremony at the beginning to recognize the late Mr. Nelson Burbank. Um, it was a really lovely ceremony. Uh, they presented the family with a signed football of all the current team members. Uh, so I know that was appreciated by the family. Uh, rep uh, representatives Richard Haggerty and Brad Jones were in attendance as well, and they provided a, a certificate of recognition from the state. So, all right. Uh, Bob, hand it over to you for town manager report. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> a number of things on my list. First and foremost, about two or three hours ago, uh, the governor declared a public health state of emergency in Massachusetts. Uh, he invoked Mass General Law, Chapter 17, Section 2A. Um, it's on vaping. Um, he has thus empowered um, the Secretary to determine what next steps to take. I've advised the Board of Health. I expect we'll hear more details formally. What I've heard informally is that uh, there could be, as early as tomorrow, a three- or four-month ban um, in order for the issue to be studied, quote unquote. And the ban is fully supported by the New England Convenience Store Association. So more to come, but uh, it looks like vapes are gonna be on the sidelines for a while. Um, the issue that some of you um, have a handout, or you all you have a handout have been discussing, um, Caitlin handed out some information about your two appointees to the retirement board. Mm -hmm. uh, at my request, Sharon checked with town council about a possible conflict of interest with the upcoming retirement board request to increase the COLA for an article at town meeting. As a result, she delayed a presentation to FinCom until later in October until she receives or doesn't receive tonight permission from the board. So of, of particular interest tonight is Sharon's Form 19B1 for your approval. If the board believes that the financial interest disclosed in that form uh, is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services that the town may expect from Sharon, you should uh, vote to approve the uh, requested exemption, and then Vanessa should sign the form. Um, in, in more common language, um, Sharon's financial interest in the matter certainly is, is small. Uh, hopefully her retirement date is many years away. Um, but it is a position where she is in a conflict as an employee. Um, she and I have had quite a bit of discussion on the issue, and she believes strongly, and I totally support her, that she should not make this presentation at town meeting because of the appearance, so that the retirement board chair has agreed to do that. She is, by the vir virtue of her position, on the retirement board. Um, she would also prefer the retirement board to make a presentation to FinCom, but she's not sure that that will be practical. So again, you should have a motion from Caitlin in front of you on uh, 
on Sharon's interests. And then uh, just for information, Carol Roberts, who is your other appointee, you appoint two out of five members, has filed a 23B3 form, which is in your packet. However, she will need to file a 19B1 form, and I'll have to ask you to approve that also. Uh, she did not attend tonight's meeting, so it wasn't uh, necessary to do that tonight. So if I could ask you to uh, vote on the motion, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Move to approve the requested exemption for Sharon Angstrom. Second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? I just have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sh Sharon is not planning to present to, to uh, town meeting, but will this exemption, is what this exemption allowing is the presentation to FinCom? Yes, okay. and, and this would allow the town meeting one, but she and I feel strongly that that shouldn't happen okay. because when she stands in front of town meeting, town meeting believes her to be a different person than a retirement board member. Okay. But that's correct. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay. okay, thank you. Motion carries. A um, couple meetings or a couple events to put on your calendar tomorrow night, uh, 925, the Arcasa annual meeting at 7 o'clock. It's Chris Herron's The First Day film at the Jordan IMAX Theater. And uh, as always, thanks to Jordan's for donating the time in the theater for this important community event. I'm happy to say that the Arcasa Outreach Coordinator position was filled. We're very fortunate to be able to hire Samantha Salkin who recently, uh, and until the first week of November, has been splitting her time between Reading and Woburn Police Departments as a certified domestic violence counselor with Respond. And previously, she'd worked in Respond residential shelters. Um, so her expertise in the uh, substance abuse area would be greatly uh, enjoyed by us. And Respond will replace her with another staff member. Um, the night after, on Thursday, at the library at 7 o'clock, a matter of civility. Uh, thanks to Deb Gilberg, Mark Doxer, and Monique Nartham for joining Amy and myself in planning this event that's open to the entire community. Um, we hope this is a good turnout. These, these events are usually very, very worth going, as I know some of the board members have, have attended. Um, I won't need to mention October 4th, because Arts Reading will do that for me. Uh, but I do want to mention October 5th at 10 a.m. is an open house at the fire station on Main Street. Um, I want to just share some statistics from Assessor Victor Santaniello with the board. 186 folks qualified for 259,000 of tax relief. That's at the 150 percent. It's an average of about $1,400 per person. Uh, again, details will follow in October. Uh, the average single family home assessed value is over 627,000. It's up 5.5 percent. Year over year, the average uh, residential tax bill is up just a little bit under $300 or just a little over 3%. And Victor has asked, uh, he got some good clarification from the board recently. Um, right now, the board is scheduled to have a preview on October 5th and a hearing on the 29th, and he wants to know if you would like him in for two dates or whether one would be sufficient. Uh, the classification on the 29th is the appropriate date for that, but the question is whether you want him in on the 15th in advance. So if you can just email me back or come to some conclusion tonight, that would be helpful. So he's due in on the 5th? He's going to come in on the 29th, so on that night he could handle the classification and, and summarize the senior tax program for you. He thinks it's easily doable in one night because of the guidance you've given him previously. But if you want him to come in on the 15th to do sort of the first step and then the classification hearing on the second meeting, that's okay too. Um, other years, the board hasn't had the discussion you've already had with him to set him up for the classification. So it's up to you. It, um, would anyone like to have him? Because we can settle this now. Yeah. With someone with, I mean, I'm inclined to have him with just the second one, but. Just the first one. It's just the second, second one. Second. So it's a preview and then the actual vote. Um, so I, I, where this ultimately goes is if we don't opine on it now, but right. whether or not we think the uh, tax which, uh, the tax classification should change, yep. then we need to provide guidance for him for the 15th mm -hmm. so that he can present those numbers of the 29th. If we don't plan on having him change the, it. The tax classification meaning the the for the entire town or relative, because we've given him guidance on the senior thing mm -hmm. already. For the town. For the whole time, for the whole not time. just seen. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and also, he's certainly more than available to talk to any individual members at any time, just so you're aware of that also. I mean, I'm inclined to only have him come for the, what is it, October 29th? But I'm flexible, depending on what others think. How much time would we allocate for him? Are we talking an hour plus? Um, we have half an hour it, scheduled. It would have been two half time. hours if you split it. I think if you just put it all into one night, it might be 45 minutes, potentially an hour. Um, it's really your choice. Well, I, I suspect we're going to have. Your next meeting is busy, the 15th. Yeah, it is. And I'm guessing we're going to have, um, again, as we always have had, there's been a large public outpouring on classification, around classification time. I mean, so do yeah, we yeah. spread that out over two? Do we do it in one? I mean, what's going to be the better way to do it? Is the 15th already jammed the capacity? It's getting full, and you just added another hearing, so... It's a little more full than 29th. Either one will work. We'll make either one work. And what's our deadline? 29th is our deadline? Um, I will have to check. No, I don't think so. But right now, you're only scheduled to meet once in November because of town meeting and Veterans Day. Veterans Day is on a Tuesday. Yeah. Um, and, and town meeting's on a Tuesday also. So, I'm sorry, uh, town meeting's on a Tuesday. Veterans Day's not. Why don't we just yeah. to keep the meeting going? Why don't we table this for the agenda portion? Okay. of the okay. evening because there's a lot going on on both the 15th and the 29th as I'm looking at here so okay just a couple other things um, one is a Walnut Street issue um, normally staff and myself can solve resident issues without bringing them to the board but this one's a little tricky um, I'll summarize by saying this is now what some residents at the end of Wal Walnut Street see uh, and it used to just be trees um, MassDOT um, has installed some equipment, uh, some for themselves, some for the light department. Uh, but MassDOT has been very clear that a business, whether there's a light shining on residents now, they do not care. Um, I was a little surprised at the attitude I saw in emails, but it is what it is. Um, they made it clear that even if RMLD wanted to put up screening to help the residents, they will not be allowed to do that because it is their land. So I bring this to the board just as a preview that I am likely to be going to our representatives and our senator with this uh, because um, it just doesn't seem like very good customer service. And uh, MassDOT um, was out at 6.30 in the morning on a Saturday against our construction hour hours, and they started doing this work without notifying anyone. They didn't tell us. They didn't tell the police. They didn't tell the residents. So certainly there's very poor communication in this issue. So I just wanted to advise the board about this in case any of you hear from the Walnut Street neighbors. Um, a couple weeks ago, just around your last meeting, you heard from a woman at Redding Commons about a water meter issue. Um, the problem's been solved, she's moving. Um, the problem was the town has one giant meter, compound meter, uh, at the facility at Redding Woods. So all the meters within the units, we don't touch, we can't touch by law. Um, so she had worked with the property uh, manager, and uh, I guess she just came to the conclusion that it just wasn't acceptable to her, whatever was going on, and we really don't know. We can't see individual usage um, unless they share it with us. And so we'd offered to... Uh, you know, get involved as we could, and then she just today said that she was going to move. So that problem has uh, gone away, if you will. Um, lastly, I, I just want, did want to ask the board, um, do you want on a future agenda shortly to vote on warrant articles? Um, that hasn't been done for a couple of years. Boards have done it in the past. They've not done it in the past. Um, I, I ask specifically because when um, two of your members sponsored an article, other members seem to want to say something. And if the board uh, wants to say something in writing, then uh, putting it on an agenda and taking a vote on them you know, would, would be helpful in that regard. I also want to ask, probably Andy and Vanessa will write up the background, but then again, the board may also wish to add to that background. Um, so I just wanted to ask you if you want to put that on an agenda. Um, if so, that has to be probably October 15th, just to get it in print for November town meeting. I think the 29th is too late. Uh, and that's all I have. Thanks, bud. All right, uh, we'll open it up to public comment. Uh, please raise your hand, provide your name and address. Kindly keep comments uh, to topics under the purview of this board. 
please no derogatory or campaign related comments and I see numerous other elected officials in the room so if you are a member of another elected office please indicate if you are speaking as a board or committee member or liaison or as a resident so and you, oh and uh, kindly keep your comments to two minutes if you can any public comment for Eaton Street. So I'm here tonight about the Eastern Gateway presentation, the uh, crossing road. So I just want to request if uh, many of my neighbors are coming to for uh, for eight o'clock. So if if possible, if you could allow some public questions. Of course, absolutely. Thank I'll open it up at that time. Thanks, Brian. Any other public comment? Um, just quick, um, Megan Fiddler Carey, 64 Charles Street, and I'm speaking right now on behalf uh, uh, as a member of the Reading Cultural Council. Um, I was just listening to the list of dates, and I just wanted to also put out there that on October 15th is due um, the applications for the grants that we have, many grants for um, community art and cultural programming. So I just wanted to make sure that that's spread far and wide and everybody hears that as many times as we can get it out before October 15th. Okay. Thanks, Megan. Any other public comment? Yes. Virginia Adams with my walkable Reading hat on tonight. We have a number of other uh, members here, and I assume that you've all read the uh, memo that we sent uh, regarding the repaving of South Main Street, and we wanted to uh, make sure that you are up to speed on that, and if there's any questions that you might have, we're here to help answer them. I think it's going to be a <coughs> missed opportunity if we don't uh, try to get on the uh, bandwagon right away and we encourage you to start thinking about that. They've already started the work on South Main Street as you know and the whole thought of the road diet was that um, we could try it out for so many months because it would be in between the times of the initial paving and the final paving. So. Thank you for thinking about it. We're sorry we couldn't get on the agenda to give you a good presentation, but it'll be on ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Yes. Hi, uh, Virginia of Logic 9 on Prescott Street, also walk already. Um, we also wanted to mention that um, we were somewhat taken back when the meeting was held August 28th. Uh, about the South Main Street paving to find out that there are all sorts of issues with the two crosswalks on South Main Street, one being at the intersection of Main and Minot, and the other being at Knollwood. There are currently crosswalks there. Um, and apparently there was some discussion about the fact that um, it was four lanes of traffic and we thought that we were hopeful. Uh, initially we were thought, thought they were going to put in some of the signs like that at REI that our pedestrian activated, push the button, and you know, it, it blinks. It's not a red, yellow, and green light. It just blinks to alert someone that they're crossing. And apparently, after talking to um, Frank Percival uh, in DPW, the Mass Department of Transportation is now reconsidering reinstalling those crosswalks at all because they feel that they're not safe, that it's not safe to cross four lanes of traffic if there isn't a full light. And that would mean that there would be no crosswalk on Main Street between Maine and Washington and Summer Ave. Now, we were very dismayed to hear that. We, and uh, one of the reasons that we were, it was, if it's incorporated with the road diet, you reduce your travel lanes to one north and one south, uh -huh. the turn lane and bike lanes, and therefore it is safer to cross. And therefore, you know, it would be appropriate to have the crosswalks there. So I know that they're already moving. I know that that's an issue, but up until March of last year, we believed that the road diet was still on for South Main Street, and we don't know why or how it disappeared. Um, we're not sure where that call came from to not put the road diet in, but to do North Main Street. So we just, again, dismayed at the, at the prospect of not having a chance to try it. We know that people initially hear that and they panic that the traffic will get worse, but studies have shown and there were studies done in Reading with traffic numbers and so on, that it actually helps the traffic. So, and then maybe we can think about North Main Street getting some publicity and some information out to citizens before that happens so that it would be understood better and can have a better trial. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, I've been getting pinged with this question a lot as far as the road diet goes. I know a study was conducted, um, and to Virginia's point, there was a recommendation initially by the state that there be a road diet on South Main Street. I know you and I have had conversations. Actually, no. That was a, st a town recommendation, but not the state. But not the state? No. Um, have we, as a town, made any efforts to reach out to the state to try and change that? I know contracts have already been bid out and, and there's a scope of work, but... We, we had a meeting in this room. I'm, I want to be careful with open meeting law and this not being on the agenda, but we had a meeting in this room. Andy sat in as your representative and it was almost unanimous at Senator Lewis's request to proceed with the paving project, otherwise the funds were going to be lost. And to do the road diet in the future should it be uh, available. Now, as I've said to the board, the uh, northern section road diet was a total surprise to us and a change in the contract after they went out to bid last March. And we have a staff meeting on that tomorrow, so we'll be able to get more information out to the public. So the road diet on the South Main has absolutely sailed two years ago with the paving project. And the road diet on the north is said to be temporary as a trial period, and we'll get, again, more information tomorrow. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm confused. You're saying that the state um, does not want to implement the road diet or test the road diet out on Southern Maine? Correct. Hmm. Any further public comment? Uh, Michelle Freeman, uh, 129 West Street and Running. And I wanted to thank the select board for the demonstration on the development of policy regarding short-term rentals in Reading. With several new developments in their construction in town, as Reading residents, we'd be concerned if there was no restrictions preventing the buying of a property solely for the purpose of offering the short-term rentals and of our size. But however, as Airbnb hosts in our home for the past few years, we've hosted over 100 um, guests in our owner-occupied home in the historic West Street area. And we found Airbnb to be a positive experience for our family. And it's, um, well, we would not want to see Reading overrun with rental properties. Um, we found that operating Airbnb in our home has provided a relatively affordable stay for our town family visiting Reading, um, people who are house hunting in Reading, as well as travelers and fixers. Um, so we wanted to just um, thank you for the opportunity to um, <clears throat> share that Airbnb is a positive experience. Thank you. Any other public comment? Thanks. I'll be back on. So Megan Fitzgerald again, 64 Charlotte Street. Um, that's the other reason I'm at this meeting. I'm not sure. I was wasn't sure if we should say that now or when we're talking about Airbnb. I'm also an Airbnb host in owner occupied home. And Michelle just said everything I was going to say, which is it's been a wonderful experience. I met really cool, neat people. And the best is when it's people who are checking out Reading to move here. It's really nice to be able to sort of be an ambassador in that way. Um, and also to help neighbors who want to have their families stay close by but don't necessarily have the space to host them. So I do want to give a plug for the owner occupied, but I definitely agree that there should be some regulation for the, the other option. So. Okay. Thank you. Other public comment? Yes. I'm Dave Talbot, 75 Linden, speaking as a resident, not as a board member. Um, but just to, you know, looking at this image of the uh, traffic, the, the bright street light on Walnut and the communications problems from MDOT, I wonder, uh, you know, if we've had the same thing happen with, the, with this concept of reducing the lanes and making them more uh, visually, uh, aesthetically pleasing, more, um, you know, less of a kind of a, my first time moving into Reading and driving down Route 28 from the 128 interchange, it's it's not an attractive highway, it's dangerous, you can't cross it, it's pedestrian unfriendly, there have been fatal accidents, there have been um, pedestrian fatalities along the roadway. I understand what Bob said that, it, that the ship sailed two years ago, and I, I don't doubt what he said. I would just encourage you as road commissioners to say, hey, this is a once in a generation opportunity to transform our streetscape. We need the data to see if it would work, but if it would on both South and, and North Main Street, I think it would be the most wonderful thing to happen to the town, really in a generation in terms of the in many dimensions, aesthetics, traffic safety, pedestrian safety. Um, you know, people want to be able to go visit businesses by means other than driving. So understanding it's late in the process, I would still encourage you as road commissioners to do as you can to reopen this matter and, and let's get back on this and, and I'll support you anyway I can. And, um, if 
we do need the data. I know there's some skepticism out there about it. It's, it I understand why people would be skeptical. Data is how you will answer that, and a temporary striping of both south and north would be the way to get the data you need to see if this great thing could be could work in this town. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other public comments? Okay. So next up, we're going to have a presentation from Arts Reddick. Wait, want to both come up? Good evening. I'll, I'll go ahead and say uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for allowing us to show our presentation tonight. My name is Joseph Leto. I'm the president of Arts Reading. I'm here with my associate. Tom Coffin. Uh, we've got an arts festival coming up on the town common on October 5th. That's going to be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And we have a rain date of the following day, the 6th, from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. We have 15 organizations are going to participate, and we have uh, five groups are going to perform and provide entertainment. Uh, there'll be no food or drink sold, and uh, hopefully we will be able to pull this off. Last year we did not have a rain date, and we got chased. Around noon we just pulled the plug and sent everybody home, so this year hopefully we'll be able to pull this off. And one of the groups participating this year is the Reading PD. So they're going to be running around rounding up politicians and uh, <laughs> yeah, no, the <laughs> story of my life. <laughs> We're going to, it's, a, it's a wonderful festival that we look forward to. Even last year, everybody had smiles on their face, faces because even one performer decided to get up and do El Capella for everybody that day. And we had a lot of um, interesting tents, although a lot of them couldn't make it because of the rain, understandably, including our uh, performances because we have a lot of electrical going out. Uh, we have uh, talked to the DPW and the rest of the departments and on everybody and getting things going, and everybody's been very kind in helping us out with a lot of uh, things. We're here to answer any questions anybody might have. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Arts Reading and, and what you do here in the community, how people can get involved if they're interested? Yes, thank you. Um, Arts Reading, we started about uh, five years ago. Um, Jesse Wilson, actually from uh, the town hall here, um, actually started getting us interested in doing it, and we all volunteered because it's a great cause. I'm a professional artist and musician and everything myself. And I like to, I work with a lot of different towns and cities and do classes and stuff like that. So I have a personal interest in getting the arts out to everybody. Um, we've also talked to the schools and stuff like that, trying to get people interested in the schools to see what programs we can get for them. Um, and we've got some of the uh, uh, younger ages coming in and do some performances for us with uh, some of the different collaborations that we have in the city. But we have a bunch of different members, um, so many, uh, geez, probably have about 20 different members of RCTV was one of them, and we have a uh, Be Heart Association, Gems for Jake. Uh, we also have uh, um, the Historical uh, Society. Commission. Um, yeah. Commission, excuse me. Um, we have so many different, you can go to artsreading.org currently, if anybody's interested, and see all of our different memberships in all of our different uh, type. We have links to their own professional sites on our web page and stuff. And we've been growing. We just became incorporated, as a matter of fact. And we're looking right now to become a 5013C. We're working on that now with Matt. Uh, you know Matt. Uh, and he's helping us out a lot, as a lot of people in the town have been uh, helping us out with getting things started and going. We're trying eventually, hopefully, to set up a cultural district or have a cultural place that we can all enjoy our crafts and stuff together and maybe a building or something. We've got a bunch of stuff. That's the way it went. Uh, but we're still working hard all these days to get things going for the town and the community. All the community. There is a contact form on our website, so if anybody would like to get involved, they can just fill out the contact form. We've got a calendar that we try to list all the cultural events in town. We've got a Facebook page. So we would love to have more people get involved. Wonderful. Thank you. Any questions Thank you. Before, Bob? Um, as they mentioned, when they started five years ago, we had uh, the idea of forming a cultural district. And uh, the thing that surprised me the most is how many organizations culturally there are in Reading. Uh, there was yes. over 100. We're even going after more. <coughs> yeah. It's just phenomenal. You, you, you named five or six that you knew, but then as you looked at the list, you're familiar with almost all of them, and you added it up, and it was like, wow. 
um, but they haven't been organized as a group so that you see the power of how many they are and the range of activities they have. That's what they've been working on, uh, you know, most recently with Matt's help. Um, you'll get there. And I know you, they keep asking me for a building. That's the only <laughs> ask they have in as a building. So I'm working on it. <laughs> maybe not a building, but I wonder if you folks might be interested in coming to present to us maybe a few times a year. Just kind of update us on how that'd be fine. Yep. The calendar. Yep. Yes. This is an opportunity to share with the community what's going yep. on. Thank you very much. That'd be terrific. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we invite everybody to, as a matter of fact, we invite everybody to come to see us on October 5th or, and or. Sixth. Um, <laughs> hopefully, the <laughs> hopefully the fifth. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's ten o'clock. Right? Yeah, ten, ten o'clock in the morning. Yep. Yeah. Right out on the common. Yes. Right on the common. Yep. Yep. And your um, website is readingart.org. Arts Reading. Arts Reading. Arts, Arts Reading. Arts Reading. Yeah. Reading Art Association is one of our members. Okay. He's the okay. president of the Reading Art Association also. Okay. Um, but not to be confused with Arts Reading. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Okay. What? Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. We Thank look forward you. to seeing you again. Much. We appreciate it. All right. OK, uh, next up, we'll be hearing from Phil Pacino um, to talk about Airbnb and absentee owners. I sit in the beach chair. Good luck. <laughs> Hi. Christoph, thank you for allowing me to come and appear in front of you tonight. Um, first off, I want to state that uh, I am not here representing any committee or board that I'm, I'm on. I'm here as a representative of Precinct 5. Uh, I am also one of the th one of the three trustees of Briarwood Estates, which is the condo association for 5 Washington Street. Uh, one of the things that's gone on is there's a lot of building in the depot area we are. Uh, and we're concerned you know, basically we're concerned about the issues that potentially Airbnb and absentee owners. Now, if you're an owner-occupied, uh, we don't have any problem with that. It's uh, really, you know, and I know the late two ladies spoke here, and that's fine. They're owner-occupied, no problem. It's more the absentee owners at this point. At Briarwood this year, the three trustees were trying to upgrade the property in conjunction with some of the other properties that we were doing. We totally re renovated the pool this past summer. Uh, we, uh, you know, our plans next spring is to totally redo the parking lot. We thank the town for paving our end of Washington Street. Very nicely to do that. It fits in nicely with us. So, and one of the things that we have is we're aware of in our building there's an Airbnb with an absentee owner. The owner does not live in this town. They live in Wakefield. The owner does at this point. We have concerns about the upkeep of the building, the safety of the building at this point too, uh, that, and we're just, you know, concerned of how the building's gonna be viewed. You know, it's, many people think five one is an apartment, bu apartment building, which is not, it's all condos at this point. Uh, there's also a concern that uh, in putting this, I uh, understand the zoning is A40, which is residential, uh, with an absentee owner that potentially could be classified as a business. There may be a zoning issue here in terms of what this is at that point. Uh, there's also some benefits to the town in terms of when we're looking maybe at some sort of regulation. First off is, you know, maybe Bob knows, as of July 1st, 2019, the local, there's a local uh, room excise tax that is short-term rentals, which is 31 days or less, is required to pay to the state. There's also a local option to that. Bob's well aware of that, I'm sure. There's a local option to that of the fact that the town can, and, and there's 11, my research indicated there's 11 cities and towns that basically have adopted the local option. And the only town I looked at is Boston and Cambridge, and they were 3% at this point. So there is a benefit to the town of Reading in terms of revenue at that. There's also, if, if you follow the potentially, and uh, you know, there was an article in the Globe a while back about the city of Boston in terms of putting regulations in. It would also allow the town some benefits in terms of trying to monitor these short-term rentals, both from the standpoint of health and also code violations in terms of that, if you're aware of, aware of these things. So those are the issues I bring. Again, we're concerned that, you know, in the, in the depot area, there's a lot of building going on. There's the cross from the depot, there's our building, there's also the, the former uh, school at the church in terms of that. And we're concerned about those places becoming basically owner investor and going on Airbnb and they're absentee owners. They're not, they're not, they're not living there. 
I know that in our building, the owner does not live there. I can show you some of the feedback, and it's, he said it takes him 20 minutes to get there. Obviously, if they're living there, they're not, it doesn't take him 20 minutes to get there. So uh, that's my concern. Again, I don't have any problem with, if you're owner occupied, it's your property. I have no problem with that whatsoever. It's the ones that are absentee ownership that basically we don't want to turn that depot area into some sort of, you know, short-term housing, you know, rental type, uh, hotel type of environment is what our concern is. That's that's what I raise. So. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Are there questions from the Bob? Um, I absolutely knew about that, but only because Julie Mercier told me about it this morning. <laughs> um, Julie has a memo or some background information that I can share with the board. Um, but I would recommend, it's an interesting topic, I'd recommend that you ask CPDC to look at it. Mm -hmm. It's really in their purview. And whether or not there's a local uh, you know, tax to adopt at a town meeting forthcoming, um, you know, they can certainly sit with you and have a joint meeting on it as well. But my guess is it's probably a complicated area. It's probably not that simple. I don't know, for instance, if you can distinguish between owner occupied and not under the law. Um, John was mentioning to me it's pretty easy to find out online what's available, but again, how foolproof is that in terms of enforcing the regulations? Well, it's a, it's a step in the right direction for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, this, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna operate a, an Airbnb unless you're advertising it. You're not gonna have anybody right. there, um, and there are many advertised in town. Um, and in some towns, and I guess it's a question that I raise, um, at a certain point, if you're going to follow up and try to do some enforcement along the lines of what Phil is talking about and to, and to manage it, you got to fund it, you know, somehow. Now, we have a hotel tax in this town. Um, we don't have a hotel, but we sort of do. We're always forward looking. Now. Yeah, I know. Right. Um, you know, if you think about it by a definition, um, and I know that there are some towns in the Commonwealth that do apply a hotel tax right. uh, to, there, to Airbnb. There are 11 uh, cities and towns. Yes. That actually have uh, put in place what they call the local a local option. A local option that they have. Well, there are two different things, Phil. One is yeah. the local option on the excise tax. The other, I, I mean, we actually have a hotel tax that's been on the books in this town for maybe 20 years. Um, and then it becomes a classification as to whether or not a short-term rental in an Airbnb is a, actually, it, it meets, meets a lot of the definitions of a hotel. Um, and so that is separate from the excise tax that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So these are things, I mean, this is kind of a brave new world okay. that needs to be looked at um, so that we get it right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the idea that we'd suddenly have development for people to, you know, to buy and live and then they turn into mini hotels is a right. is kind of a different problem, you know. I mean, I think we got to we really have to look at this thing and and understand what the town's options are, what the town's role should be. Um, you know, you've got two obviously two very distinct classifications. You've got one that's being operated, a walk to the train. Well, that's you know, right. um, from where from where that condo and is. With all the development that's going on in the depot yeah. area, yeah, so, I think it's. You know, um, going forward, I think you may see more of this because you. We're not going to get that figured out, out tonight, but I'll tell you, I think it requires that we really look at this hard and understand where we stand right at the moment. I mean, we have certain laws on the books; others we don't. Um, and I think we got to get going on this because I don't think it's going to go away, and I think it actually will grow. Frankly, that's that's my concern. That it'll grow. It's further yeah. further on down the road. Yes. You've John, I agree with you. I'm curious what the rest of the board thinks. If we are in agreement that it requires further evaluation, then I think Bob is correct in that we should ask CPDC to look into it further. Because I already have a slew of questions from a practical application. Yeah, I mean perspective. It, so well, and then let's not forget that we're you know. 15, 16 months away from 50 condos going on the market, or they're going to be on the market probably before year's end. Um, and, you know, they'll be occupied 18 months from now. So um, I think we got to get on this and probably pretty quickly, too. So, other thoughts from the board? Yes. Um, I understand the predicament that you are in, and um, 
and, and I would like to be able to do something about that if possible. I also want to respect uh, the owner-occupied Airbnbs. I, I think what was said tonight is is important to the town. Um, people looking to buy in here go to these Airbnbs, and they're sort of like uh, hosts to the town. And I think they they really add value to the town. So I I would not be so crazy about um, applying a hotel tax or something like that to a owner-occupied Airbnb. Um, that said, I, I was sort of hoping, I, I sort of hoped that we talk about this a little bit more amongst ourselves. It was brought to the select board. Um, and then work collaboratively with CPDC on this. Other thoughts? I think the, uh, if CPDC is the right place, I think that's great. I think we should kind of review overall what's happening and kind of what, as a town, we want to have happen. Um, the issue would be, um, I, I agree with John, this is going to happen fast. We probably should be moving with it very quickly. Um, do we want to have uh, a staff person kind of attached with it as well? Um, and then bring it back to the board in a defined period of time. I mean, I'm fine with that. Um, to refresh my memory, who are the liaisons to CPDC? That probably means it's me. I going to say, I thought it's two of you. Yep, you look at them. Um, so would one of you like to take point on that to coordinate with Bob, staff, and CPDC? I've been trying to reach out to the chair, um, so I, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Um, so why don't we, so if you can give us an update during the liaison reports at our next meeting mm -hmm. on where that stands, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I will open it up to public comment if there's any further discussion on that. No? Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Phil. Okay, very good. Thanks, Phil. All right. Great. Next up, we'll have uh, an update from the Climate Advisory Committee. Hello. So this is, a, this is a status update on uh, things that have been happening with the Climate Advisory Committee over the last year, give you a sense of, of where we are. Um, this is our, our uh, Climate mi Committee um, members, uh, Patricia Cameron, Jeff Everson, Celeste Cracky, Ray Porter, and myself with uh, Thria Snyder and Denise McCarthy. There's been some, so Laurie and Sylvia you, uh, left the committee. She was representing RMLD on this on this uh, committee. Patricia Cameron is rep representing RMLD now, and she's a, a new member. Jeff Everson was an associate member. He's now a full member. And Peter and, and Denise are new. So we're, we're, a full, we're up to full membership on this committee at this point. Um, you, so it's been a year since we did uh, since we started the bag ban. You know, it was uh, in 2017 that we voted on this in town meeting, and it went into effect last September. Um, so we've got a year's experience. Actually, all the issues and complaints about <clears throat> the bag ban went away on September 10th, 2018. Objections to the program. There were um, there have been 
instances where somebody complained about a business and saying that they were not complying, um, DPW investigated and found that they, in fact, they were in compliance. So we've had no uh, out of compliance issues with with the bag ban. The 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 uh, bylaw provides for. Um, that, that um, there could be waivers, these, uh, that the, a business could ask for a, a six months waiver. There are two of these uh, waivers. There were five businesses asked, asked for a six month waiver. Uh, that expired then, and two, uh, business, two of the businesses asked for another one. And so that's going on now. And, that, and that, those waivers will be done this year. And so all the waivers will be finished. Um, so, and the waivers really weren't, it was pretty much if you asked for a waiver, you could get it. It wasn't really a, a difficult thing. It was just just, we were trying to be uh, pretty lenient, pretty flexible, but there were few businesses that, that needed the waivers, and and uh, as of the end of the year, won't be any that that um, that have them. Um, so everybody will be in compliance. So this, I think, has been a success for this town. Like a lot of other towns, when we started this thing back in 2017, there were 52 municipalities had had put these kind of uh, bans for plastic bags or checkout bags about in place. That number is now up to 122. So um, out of like 357, I think, municipal uh, municipalities in Massachusetts, um, and they become more strict. I know find a, a problem with the when that was that was uh, implemented there's all excuse me there's also a state plastic bag law this uh, h3945 that's proposing a, a uh, bag ban for the for the whole state and if that uh, bill passes um, all of the all of the municipal bag uh, bag bans would go away I mean it would, it would all be you know no longer applicable. The um, the bag law that's proposed is is actually more stringent than what Reading has. Uh, it's not as stringent as what the current requests are. The, the ones they're going into are, are more stringent than this. But this is, um, I, and I don't know what really the prospect is of this particular law is. It probably, you know, it probably wouldn't pass this year just because this isn't the the dead end of the session. You know. Um, several of the I'm going to list several just activities that we've sponsored. Um, so, so several of these now are, are events that we've sponsored in, in the town over the last year, like this one in February where we where we showed the film No Impact Man. Well, this is this is a story about uh, Colin Bevins and his wife and his his uh, two year old girl that that living on on Fifth Avenue in New York City decided that they wanted to go with a, a real low carbon print lifestyle so they uh, you know they they, they didn't stop um, they didn't drive for buying all their food from the, the like the farmers market um, they didn't take elevators and for six months they turned off the electricity in their apartment which was not not really the brightest thing but but it was um, but they did it anyway so they were looking for alternatives you know how do you how do you keep food fresh when you don't have a refrigerator you know things like that and um, so they were trying to do it, it's a really it was a really interesting film about uh, what they went through in the lifestyle that they, they led and how they spent their days walking up and down this this uh, you know multi-story apartment house in, in New York City and how and how you can be in the middle of New York City and and, and live a kind of a you know almost a hermit type you know lifestyle um, so it was it's a very interesting film Interestingly to me uh, was that at the end when when they asked Colin of all you know of all these things that he did if he was going to recommend one thing to uh, to someone to, to do not that they try to emulate, emulate what he did he, he would recommend that they get involved with an environmental effort that the, the real the real effect you're going to have is getting involved with the group that there's no there's no thing that you're going to do. Uh, that's really going to have a, a huge impact. It might be good to do, but it's not. Gonna, it's not going to have the uh, impact that, that, a, that a group effort is going to have. So that was one thing we did. Um, we invited Ron Dario back to give a, one of his innumerable rally presentations on climate change. I don't know if you've ever heard Ron on on climate change, but he, he gives a lot of these uh, these lectures on climate change, giving us a status of, of where we are, where the planet is. Uh, we did that in March. Uh, so April, we uh, planted a tree at, at Barrow's school. Um, this uh, coincided with um, 
the this is on Arbor Day has coincided with with the Rotary Club giving trees to the fifth graders. So at our, at uh, Barrow School we all, we also provided this uh, a flyer about about their uh, their tree, what to do with it, how to plant it, how to how to make it grow, how to how to make how to get it to survive, you know, um, and. That's not something that the, the Rotary Club does. I mean, they give them the trees, but they don't tell them what kind of tree it is or, or anything. So, so we're going to suggest that, that next year we do a little, a little broader, uh, uh, you know, look at this and, and they tell all, all the fifth graders about about the tree that they received. Uh, we we got pretty lucky here. We we got um, we got a, a, a story. We we got we, we planted the tree, got the story, and published in the Daily Times Chronicle all on the same day <laughs> above the fold so I don't know I, I don't know how that worked out the uh, bicycle uh, recycling and giveaway uh, again sponsored with uh, Reading Cares and held at RMLD uh, where we had 92 bikes donated and 71 of, of those were given away then so that this has become quite an annual event and, and a lot of people are aware of this and and a lot of families have cycled through sizes of bikes as the children have, have gotten bigger and bigger. You're um, full of puns this evening, Dave. Have hmm? you cycled through the bikes? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we had a presentation on the Green New Deal. Um, this was really well done. Uh, Gina Snyder and, and Ray Porter gave this presentation. Again, this was, it was at the library. And, and talking about how the, the Green New Deal uh, follows the same, um, these same these three pillars for sustainability: this environmental, social, and economic development that describe the Green New Deal, are the are the same pillars. I mean, th these come from the, the New Deal. This comes from, you know, 1935. You know, Francis Perkins. This is this is where these ideas came from. So, in adapting them to the Green New Deal, it's really the same the same story updated for for a uh, need to go to to uh, clean energy. We were at Friends and Family Day uh, with our monster Jenga puzzle. Um, the Jenga puzzle was a, is a kind of like a is a regular Jenga, except that the point of it was that that it was a kind of a a whole a whole ecosystem in the ocean at the top of this Jenga block with were whales and all the different you know animals in the in the in the whole network of, of who ate of who's who's eating what you know. So, some of the children were just desperate that they did not want that thing to fall. I mean, the whole point was, you know, sooner or later it's supposed to fall, right? Not, not for some of the people that came. It was really sad, <laughs> a sad case. And we said other things. So we still we continue to do our weekly Green Sense articles, uh, published in the newspapers. We we did support uh, a proposal for municipal vulnerability preparedness workshop for Reading. That never happened. That was that was a uh, that was never started. But I think it's that's still a good idea that we probably think about in the future, especially uh, considering some of the other things that we've been talking about. Uh, we still have you know still still got the dumpster and the CVS lot. We still uh, have the uh, donate a tree. Uh, uh, tr uh, d oh, 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 oh. Offering out out the hall where you can get your name on a uh, sign with uh, buying a tree, and that's that's some of the events. Uh, we've helped um, the Reading Board of, of Health sent a letter to the governor uh, asking that he. Um, that he have a, implement a, a comprehensive health impact assessment of our natural gas infrastructure before he approved any further gas infrastructure, before he approved any more pipelines or compressors or anything like that. That over a hundred boards of health have done this, so it's been it's been another movement in in uh, Massachusetts to to uh, look at the effects of um, natural gas, not just. From the dangers that they presented, like in in Lawrence, um, and not just um, from the um, greenhouse uh, gas effects of, of leaking methane into the atmosphere, but even the gas in, in, that comes out of your your cook stove or, or things that in, in your house. You know, there's over a hundred toxic, carcinogenic, radioactive, and other chemicals that are in frac natural gas, uh, and and that's why the Board of Health was was interested in this topic. Um, a little bit of an update on RMLD solar choice, uh, solar programs, and uh, 
the solar choice is the the uh, solar farms that they have they have two of them um, that you can buy shares in interesting um, half the people that participate in this program are from Reading so there's a lot of interest in in this from Reading um, in part that's probably because we don't really uh, encourage so much people putting solar on their roofs it's not a great a great economic deal but people are interested in in, uh, in buying shares of this solar choice program which actually turns the profit now I mean uh, I've got the, the I've got shares in the, in the in the solar choice one that's worth two dollars a month now I mean you know to the good so I mean it came it turned around very quickly compared to what they projected um, Solar installations, meaning like solar on roofs, uh, not not so many of them. Reading has uh, has 35. Um, RMLD 100, has 121 in, in its areas. It is uh, it, it residential installations. In it's uh, it's its whole uh, area. That it, so it's 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 got Reading, North Reading, Wilmington, and part of Linfield is the RMLD territory. Um, there is a solar rebate program, so you can get money to, if you want to do this, if you want to put solar um, panels on your roof, you can get funding, um, a rebate program here that's equal to $1.20 per watt, up to 50% of the total installed cost. And this, the, the program that they have runs through uh, June of next year. Uh, RMLD support for electric vehicles. So they're currently, 214 EVs that they know about, RMLD knows about in their territory, uh, Reading is 67 of those. They ran a program last summer to incur to give rebates on electric vehicles. That's what this EV pilot program is. Um, and then that that has expired, but you can still get rebates on um, the electric vehicle charging. Um, Station. So if you want to put an electric vehicle charging station in your home, you can get a rebate of $500 toward a level two charger for that. This is something that I think Reading should start, the town of Reading should start to, to consider seriously. Um, and we are asking that we that we start to do that. Um, future projects, well, the first one here is that I'm asking for um, some town staff support, probably out of engineering, to, to look at putting, uh, what it would take to put an electrical vehicle charging station in the lot behind CVS, um, so we could put together some kind of a proposal on the cost and timeline and what, would, what that would take. Um, we, uh, we've been talking to RMLDs for some time about what's involved, and, and we're getting a lot of help from RMLD, on, and, and, they, and they do that for other, other groups, you know, who especially like new buildings uh, where there are, are multi-units like uh, residential with commercial or multi-family dwellings or something, they encourage um, them to have charging stations. So I think we, we need to do this. Um, and I think asked to also ask FinCon then to determine what kind of a capital plan we would need. Our interest, the, the Climate Committee's interest in charging stations under, under this item is for visibility. I mean, right now, we're talking about putting charging stations in visible places in Reading, in town property, like uh, that where where people who are coming into Reading or you know visiting Reading shopping centers or whatever would see that that was an option for them. Just not that not that we're trying to to turn a profit on this particular charging station, but they, that anybody who was there could see that it's just one available. They could bring their car there, and then that's a, that's an option for them. Because there's this chicken and egg thing going. You know, do you have an electrical vehicle? Do I have a, a charging station for it? You know, and, and that's that's one of the things that that slows this down. So I think this would be a, a pretty straightforward, not a, not a particularly expensive item. We're also uh, planning to approach um, businesses like you know places like Jordan's and Home Depot where there are big parking lots and people go there and, and stay for a little while you know they're gonna be in the park there for a little while you could also charge up we'll, we'll be approaching them but I think the town of Reading also needs to take 
take some leadership here. We are starting a new sustainability plan. We've done this before, but it's been several years now. And I think there's a new interest now uh, with, our, with our new leadership to, to, to have a more holistic view of, of what's going on. Uh, and so we're, we're launching that of how, how to describe really a whole sustainability plan for Reading. Um, we think other things we can do is are to, um, consider uh, putting solar energy on municipal buildings for, our, for the town's use, not, not to sell the electricity, but to, to actually use the electricity and, and offset the town's bills. And, uh, and then also additional um, uh, uh, um, recycling options. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, unless you have questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, two, two questions, or, or uh, I guess a statement, a comment, and a question, Dave. Um, is it my understanding that, that there's a movement towards heating and cooling buildings with these heat pumps um, and that are then combined maybe with solar power, so the solar power would, would drive mm -hmm. the fan and the heat pump? And if it was a, a geothermal heat pump, it'd be even more effective at heating and cooling. And that it, it, does that provide a cost savings to to the you know to either the individual or the institution that's in, that's installing that sort of thing? Yeah. So it's you know it depends on what you're comparing it to. Um, so right. heat pumps have become practical at the kind of temperatures that we see in New England, you know, sub-zero temperatures. Um, and that they is cheaper than, than oil, not as cheap as natural gas. So it's kind of in that in that area. Uh, that you may be aware that um, the Green Sanctuary Committee of the uh, uh, UUC Church is, is going to, um, they have a speaker tomorrow night at the library on kind of the, the transition off from natural gas, and one of the things is 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 that you know is, is switching to heat pumps and, and off natural gas, uh, and it's part of the general electrification of Massachusetts, moving uh, uh, much of our energy needs from um, fossil fuels, whether that's transportation or whether that's home heating, to electricity uh, for for the home heating for the heating part. That means that means heat pumps generally. It could mean uh, ground source heat pumps, you know, where you where you Run a pipe into the ground and, and pump heat back and forth from the from the, the earth. You know, just the, the earth becomes your source, or it could be air sourced heat pumps. Uh, either one, but yes, I mean heat pumps are going to be the, the the thing of the future, I guess. <coughs> so for for a migration away from fossil fuels. So I, I guess my the thought that I just like to put out to the board is, uh, <coughs> you know, as we move forward to have. Uh, in the capital plan when we discuss replacing HVAC systems and things like that, um, if we could uh, require a uh, incorporation of some sustainability aspect to these projects, I think in the long term, you know, it, it will save us some money and, and um, have other benefits as well. Are you talking about town buildings, properties, or what, what? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, to have the town back this sort of technology, this sustainable technology for the town um, in, in sort of many aspects of the way we spend money and the way we do repairs, the way we build buildings. Um, I just wanted to throw that at the board for, for consideration. Well. I just want to let the board know on December 3rd you'll get a presentation from the facilities department on things like this. So we met with Noresco this morning as a review of our eighth year of performance contracting. Um, and there is a proposal in the capital plan to do a phase two in two years, more or less. So you will start to hear this discussed by the facilities department on December 3rd. David, under future projects, you talk about the sustainability plan. Is that um, a holistic view for sustainable efforts, both private and public, in Reading? Well, it's, I think it's public. Um, okay. on, uh, but I, but on the, on the other hand, we're not far enough into it that mm -hmm. if, you, if you have something in particular in mind, I think we want to. We, we certainly could 
could look at that. You know, I, I mean, it's kind of we've been we've had several conversations um, about and, and and of the things. I mean, I, while I'm proposing that we kind of leap into le uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Mm -hmm. That's a very kind of you know narrow perspective mm -hmm, mm -hmm, of what mm -hmm. of what matters, and it's not the, the biggest effect for mm -hmm. for Reading. So I think I think um, I'm open to it. if you have something in particular, if you have something in mind, then then um, you know we want to put it on put it in the get it on the outline. I, if it doesn't get you know, I, I was more of a question about mm -hmm. what the whole how holistic how was whole? the whole was the holistic mm -hmm. view that you're. Yeah. That, so. so right now, yeah. So so I think right now it's 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 looking at, at Reading as a, t as a town. I'm not, but I'm not saying Reading buildings necessarily. I mean, you know, we have lots of issues, and Reading does a good job on, you know, like stormwater. You know, and it's like a model, you know, for the for the state of how we treat these things. I mean, the sustainability issues affect everybody, right. private property and public and, mm -hmm. and, and town property. So. Um, I'd like to suggest that um, the board put onto an agenda probably in November. We had a, present a great presentation from the RMLD several months ago that started some discussions that we didn't have time to complete. Mm -hmm. And some of them related to EVs and charging and solar and a number of the areas that we're talking about here. I'd like to suggest we put that on an agenda for November, mm -hmm. bring it forward, ask the RMLD to join, certainly the Common Advisory Committee and, and the public as well. But to get some of the, I'm going to call them narrow for a minute, some of the narrow ones that could be on the agenda sooner than later, um, to see where they are and see if we might be able to move them forward. I think I detected from the RMLD some interest in doing some things, and there was a discussion I think we, we didn't have time for, and we should have that. Well, so that's a great idea. Actually, last week when I attended the Climate Advisory Committee, the discussion that we had was in regards to possibly having them create a matrix of potential ideas, low-hanging fruit, big-picture ideas, um, having them. I know they've reached out to members of the Finance Committee, um, members of CPDC. Uh, there was a representative from RMLD commissioners there as well. And so they're already down, going down this path. Uh, I would want to wait until they provide guidance for when they might want to put that forward before we slot them in for November. Um, I don't know if they've even had a second meeting yet in the following hours. Um, but I think it's a great idea to bring it forward again. Great. And I just would encourage, as much as we want to think holistically and very broadly, um, the notion of some low hanging fruit may be a really smart mm -hmm. way to move ahead. Great. Any other questions from the board or the public? Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Yes. So pause there for just a moment, Mark. I know we have um, numerous neighbors uh, here that are interested in the new crossing road development. Is that correct? Can I get some? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, how do you feel about flipping with them so that we can? Great. Yeah, we're going to. We're already twenty minutes. Behind. We're, we're a little over. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, we'll now have Jean Delio, our assistant town manager. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes to give a little background on what you're going to hear from tonight from our team that has been working on what we're referring to as the Eastern Gateway. And um, you'll see in the slide presentation broadly what that area is that we're talking about. But it's basically the Walker's Brook area that we've um, recoined it as the Eastern Gateway. So um, we, st we started this process a really long time ago, doing economic development planning and trying to drill down. But before I get into that, I just want to spend a minute and recognize some of the people that we've been meeting with under this initiative. Um, you understand, you saw Boreana earlier um, with the neighborhood group. It's really always great to have Boreana involved. Um, she and I spent the better part of a year and a half going to meetings for the Eaton Lakeview 40B project. So we work for very well together and it's been great um, keeping, keeping the momentum going through this effort. Um, I also want to recognize some of the um, commercial and industrial property owners in the area. Um, 
Peter Fuller is here from Frame Corporation. I want to say thank you. I, I know uh, it's getting a little late, but we appreciate you coming, and we've um, we've enjoyed sitting down and talking to property owners as we think about uh, new ideas for this area. Uh, one of our main goals was um, making sure we don't hurt any existing businesses. So having that dialogue with those businesses and property owners uh, was something that really put a lot of value into the process. I also want to recognize Ed Sartell from Sartell Electric. Um, we've had a couple of really great conversations with Ed about um, his thoughts on this. And um, Northeast Cutlery, I think I saw Brett is here. Um, that's a major um, property in this area that they've done a lot of nice work down there. So uh, we appreciate sitting down with them. And I thought I saw Johnny Barbas from Barbas Trucking. Um, so that pretty much, and I don't know if anyone's here from Barbas. <coughs> Okay, there you are. I didn't see you. Um, I thought Colleen was coming. So um, that pretty much is a representation of, I think, all of the businesses that are back there and all the users. Um, and, and this is specifically in the area that we're terming the yard, which is the area behind RMLD. Um, I also want to introduce the team. So to my right is David Gamble from uh, Gamble Associates. They're an architecture and uh, urban design firm. David also is a lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And so we're very pleased and very excited to be working with David through the um, grant that we got from the state as a housing choice community. Um, and really, the mission for David was to help us with a vision for this area. And he's going to walk you through what that looks like in a minute. Um, I also want to recognize the staff that are in attendance. Julie Mercier, the Community Development Director. Um, she, she's been a big part of this and always a um, key member of the team. Um, Andrew McNichol, our staff planner. Um, he's been with us now for about a year and a half. And um, Andrew and I have spent a lot of time working together and uh, coming up with some different ideas. And last but certainly not least is Erin Schaefer. Erin uh, joined our team in June, and she is our relatively new economic development director. Some people are saying new, but Erin um, brings a breadth of experience and expertise to the project, too. So we're very pleased to have that um, level of staff. So just to take another quick minute to kind of frame how we got here, uh, and there is a detailed memo in the packet. Um, but Really, we've done an intensive amount of planning to get to this point. And um, the way I view it, um, we looked at a lot of the things like modifying the zoning and the Smart Growth District. Um, we brought in the professor from Northeastern. Some of you were here for that. Um, professor Bluestone, he helped us do a, an economic development self-assessment. It was called the EDSAT. And that was a series of a couple hundred questions that we really, um, in a public forum, um, took a good look in the mirror and said, you know, how are we doing with economic development and how are we, compared to, compared to other communities, how are we stacking up? Um, and one of the big uh, takeaways from that exercise was the town really needed a plan. And uh, that's music to our ears as planners. Um, so we were lucky to um, scrape together some money and get a little bit of grant funds and hire the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. We put the Economic Development Action Plan together, multiple public meetings and forums, and lots of community input. And um, that also led to, when we discussed it here in this room, um, lots of ideas about maybe we should hire somebody to carry out economic development, and that was the hiring of the economic development director. Um, and so I don't want to uh, overstate, but we've certainly made a concerted effort to have a lot of public input into the planning process. And last Wednesday, I think, was a good example of how we like to work uh, in the reimagined Reading, which was a downtown reimagine. Um, but having those kinds of workshops and, and public forums really um, give us the input that we need to come up with the plans that we think are representative of what the community wants. Um, and really what we're talking about is managed growth. Um, we were able to define where the town is okay with growth through the uh, plan. And we have key areas that have been identified. Um, and so that now brings us to three more or less guiding principles that we run with. 
the first one is to keep downtown vital the second one is to preserve what's important and the third one is to be queued up for opportunities and with those three guiding principles we really see some opportunities in the eastern gateway to um, come up with some new ideas and to basically reimagine this area um, and again working collaboratively not hurting any businesses not going beyond uh, but in a way that would um, breathe new life into the area um, and then one last thing and I'll stop we are also working um, and again this came out of the neighborhood comp, uh, process with the Eaton Lakeview 40B we're doing a uh, corridor analysis and conceptual redesign of the Walker's Brook area and so those are all the um, streets in and around that area so Walker's Brook Drive Washington Street um, John Street Corridor, Ash Street Corridor, um, and that is being conducted by Green International. And they're going to be using traffic count data to um, really get a sense of what those counts look like. And planning level options will be developed to address safety and operational deficiencies. And again, when we started looking at the development in Eaton Lakeview, we realized, and the neighborhood was great about um, flagging this, that we really need, again, a holistic view of what's going on with all these intersections and what's going on with all these all the traffic that we're going to anticipate. Um, and then the, the critical intersections uh, Green is going to look at, and the, uh, the Ash Main Street inter excuse me, intersection is, is a key one over by Jiffy Lou. You know, that is a dangerous intersection. And the um, entrance into Market Basket is another intersection that they're going to really drill down to. Um, and lastly, the um, multimodal connectivity, biking, walking, driving, that's going to be explored between the two primary <coughs> commercial areas, Walker's Brook and downtown, as well as Lake Ponapowit. So, um, that's really kind of the way I wanted to frame this. Um, there's a lot of exciting things that David's going to show you, so I'm going to stop there and let David take it over. And David, if you want to use the pointer, I do. Uh, you can advance that way. And there's a dot. There's a, um, right. a dot thing here. If you want to here and highlight. So, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Gene. Uh, thank you, Select Board, for giving us the opportunity to talk uh, tonight. I do think it's a happy coincidence that there's also Arts Reading and Walkable Reading and the uh, Climate Advisory uh, Committees here because we're going to talk about some of these themes in an area that you wouldn't necessarily associate with those groups. So I'm, I'm glad you're here. It's just a happy coincidence. Uh, you have a beautiful downtown. As I was driving up this evening, the sun was setting on the on the steeple, and the, and it came up on your historic building and the yard, and it was really very impressionable. It's what's making the real estate values go up as much as they are. Unfortunately, not every part of the downtown is as special as this place is. And so what we want to talk about tonight is ways in which areas that are former industrial, uh, largely forgotten, maybe not even very accessible, could, over a long period of time, transform and become a complement to what you have in the historic downtown. So uh, across the country, where you see a lot of transformation happening is in these former residual areas along train tracks, if you're close to your commuter rail, uh, buildings that are maybe historic but a little bit forgotten. And there's a really interesting geography in which we're working here. Uh, we mentioned the trails uh, that Reading has and how that's a, a magnet for downtown. So we want to talk a little bit about what some of these drivers are. And can you hear me in the back? OK. And can I stand? Uh, because it's just a little bit more comfortable. Uh, so before I begin, and it's a short presentation, I know you've been here 90 minutes, I want you to entertain two polar opposite notions. The first is that planning matters, actually. When each property owner is only dealing with their own property in terms of parking and access and green space, you lose the sense of connectivity. On the other hand, people get planning fatigue. <laughs> I'm actually surprised that there's this many people here on an evening meeting for the select board. It shows that there's community engagement and commitment. But people get tired of public meetings. They want to see progress. So, so that's the one spectrum. The second is that uh, in order to transform an area, it takes some bold and visionary thinking. And it actually takes the desire to draw on other people's properties, which as a planner, uh, we do normally. But if it's your own property, boy, you get pissed off pretty quickly, right? Uh, 
so the bold and visionary on the one hand, and then the incremental and judicious, right? You actually have to move slowly over time, and then oh, these things can build up and have an impact. So finding where you are in that spectrum, and I actually don't know what the political climate or the tensions are here, but I suspect if it's your property, you're going to be very concerned. And if you're maybe somewhere else in town, but you're not a direct abutter, you may be interested in these themes because the impacts will be less on your property. So let's just talk a little bit about that transformation. And really all across the country you're seeing towns competing for economic development and they're trying to build on what they have. What are their assets to make them distinctive? And you actually have quite a few. Uh, we're talking specifically about this more or less nine acres. Okay, here's Ash Street. This is the worst intersection I've ever seen. Uh, uh, the, the highway there, Walker's Park Drive. It's a larger area that I think in the coming generation people will really consider how much surface parking there is and whether we need these big boxes. But let's leave that for another day. We're really just focusing on this site, uh, the town yard, the light department building, which is a, a, a great, a great uh, space. This was one of the four uh, priority development areas in the MAPC plan from 2015. So this was one of the four. Uh, and you, re you really have these, what we see is these concentrations of opportunities. Uh, you are near the commuter rail, and that is becoming more and more important as a driver for economic development. You're seeing in your downtown, there, were, there, were, there was talk a little bit about, well, should we move the station? No, you shouldn't. You're actually seeing development here. It's happening. That's great. Uh, another station is unlikely, but you're close enough that people can get from A to B. That's a great thing. That's not going away. That will continue to grow. And all across sort of Massachusetts, but even the broader geography, you're seeing new development that's taking advantage of that proximity to transit, uh, thinking about, yes, slightly higher density, not Airbnbs, or, but higher, slightly higher density to take advantage of that proximity to transit, uh, being a little bit less reliant on the car. And you may not have this particular condition with a streetcar, but you've got that there, and that's a great opportunity. Secondly, as you're seeing a lot of, and you've probably experienced these yourself, small, funky arts stores, shops. This is actually, uh, Aaron brought this to our attention in Asheville, a remarkable arts uh, destination, actually, for all of the eastern seaboard. And you see people occupying these existing buildings and not thinking about tearing them down, but reusing them in new, interesting ways. And there's lots of examples. I live in Watertown, uh, by the way, an art center in an old industrial building. Imagine that. Aren't you looking for a new building? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, outdoor performances, not a reflection of the arts, but an expression of it. If, in fact, there are 100 organizations and you need a, a, a place where that can happen, we actually think it could happen in this area. And there's just so many opportunities. You know, we were peeking around some of the existing buildings where you're seeing climbing gyms and active spaces, and, and uh, it's this industrial character that you actually can't recreate. And, and you've got a lot of that down in this area, and there's existing buildings that are, are perfectly functioning businesses, but over time, even we work space, co-working spaces are becoming more and more attractive. So the lesson here, what I want you to remember, is that we're not suggesting that you demolish what's there. There's a great deal of uh, uh, benefits that you have in, in the businesses, but these areas are becoming interesting places to occupy. And I suspect when we look at the data from the Reimagine uh, uh, Reading, people are talking about these types of places, these third places that are cafes and brew pubs and interesting restaurants. In these older buildings, of course, you can't go wrong with sausage, bacon, and beer. Uh, uh, along the Atlanta Beltline, all these old industrial buildings that are now cool, funky, edgy, interesting places for people of all ages. You've really got some great, great opportunities, and there's a million examples, uh, rock gyms, uh, that you can see. The third piece is your open space network. And actually, you have to look a little bit closely to see that as a system. It used to be one, but over time, as we culverted things and channelized uh, the rivers and the, and, the, and the lakes, that's no longer present. We think you could actually amplify that in this area by thinking of it as an amenity, of increasing the trail network, of getting more open spaces. <coughs> You're seeing this all over the country where people are just anxious to get out into nature and you're so close here, uh, but this area is probably 99.9% .9 asphalt right now. And, and you just don't recognize that you're so close uh, to, to a, a natural amenity. This is a project I worked on in Buffalo. 
creating a sense of place with an infrastructure investment. All it is is a sidewalk, uh, but it's a 22 foot sidewalk that's heavily landscaped, well lit, and it started to create an identity for a place that lacked one. Uh, and again, there's, you may have been in Chicago and seen this, or in Philadelphia. All of these trails are, are becoming great opportunities. And lastly, this idea of the waterways to try to organize portions of that space. So Weston and Sampson, who we actually have worked with environmental engineers, located, I think, to that building because they saw the, the, the opportunity of that landscape. And we'd like you to think about, about the water network, which floods <laughs> periodically ch creating a stronger sense of co cohesiveness using the landscape and thinking about the office park uh, and the buildings that are this is this is in Reading UK <laughs> but but the idea that you have there are three to four story office buildings 20 thirty thousand square feet there is an economic benefit there if you start to think of this area as a campus okay so with that as a have a precursor it ain't that easy right? Uh, because there's lots of challenges in thinking about that. One is that the, the market forces are going to require a greater density than most of the residents on Ash Street would prefer, simply because of the cost of land and the cost of construction. It, it usually gives you a bigger building than you want, and so the market forces are something to remember. Uh, we just talked about the natural systems, but there's always a need for surface parking, and there never seems to be enough. Uh, there are scale discrepancies between the small single family homes along Ash Street and the notion that these are some bigger buildings uh, behind it down the hill. And uh, every property owner right, has their own timelines and goals. And, and it's very difficult to think and actually anticipate or coordinate how those things happen. So these are real. Uh, these will remain. And, uh, and as Gene said, there is a dialogue emerging. And what we'd like you to do is to think about how that could evolve over time. So uh, you're seeing a bigger scale development. I actually think that's appropriate next to the train station. Um, <coughs> this is what I meant. You wouldn't actually think about that as amenity, as an amenity, but it, it certainly could be if you thought about all the uh, 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 public works maybe relocating down the road. Uh, the scale discrepancies, I actually also think this is appropriately scaled. It was probably uh, controversial, but it's got a setback and it's mixed juice, and I think it actually looks pretty good now that they repainted it. Uh, uh, I suspect there's a lot of controversy on this one <laughs> on Main Street. So the funny thing is, as beautiful as this is, it's about a 10-minute walk to Ash Street and, and the Gateway area. And you couldn't be farther apart from a place that's cherished and a place that actually needs, needs some investment. And by that I mean public investment and possibly even repositioning. Uh, so you can't get from parcel to parcel, actually. You have to jump over barriers and, and buffers and things that just naturally emerge over time. Uh, so just imagine for a moment, and again, thinking on that one side of the spectrum, the bold and visionary. Uh, oh, and you're doing this now. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is too important of a building to be vacant. I'm not sure what the environmental conditions are, but we see this as actually as a great art center or something that's an anchor. You've got an anchor already in this district. Uh, that's the electric flood department building. Uh, imagine if this interstitial space was actually thought of more about as a right of way. It could be a shared street. It could be even. It could even remain this, but it's it's an access or it's an alley that connects one part to another. So we're looking here towards the building uh, light department here. Uh, buffers, rain gardens, pedestrian lighting, bicycle tracks, uh, it, uh, more active uses or even greater visibility into what's happening in there, bringing in the landscape. Uh, what you need is actually an anchor that starts to rehabilitate this building and the area around it. So what we're suggesting, and you'll see in a second in the plans, is, is thinking about this not as a no man's land or an interstitial space, but actually as a place, a way to get from A to B and to circulate around the neighborhood, largely uh, walkable, but also providing access. This is a no-brainer. I'm sorry, as someone from, not from here, uh, you should not repave this lot. It should be a park. And I think the neighborhood deserves a park. And I think it would be a great way to bring in art, 
I, I, I suspect we haven't, we're not original in thinking of this. I, people must have been talking about this. Make that a community amenity that has a great relationship to Ash Street and turn that into a real destination. If we even cheated and put Center for the Arts or <laughs> something. But boy, that, that would be a community project. That would get these people on board. I, again, I don't know how big this is, but any architect would die to do a project like this. And, and that would create a greater anchor to this green space if you thought about that as a green space, which again is within a 10 minute walk. Uh, this is likely to be seen, met with some concerns naturally. How many people live on Ash Street? Raise your hand. Or in the area? Yeah. Only one. <laughs> I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, so here we're looking up at Ash. There again is a light department building. Uh, imagine if this was a park. Imagine if that was rehabilitated. Imagine because you're within a five minute walk to the train station, you had three story mixed use buildings with some higher density residential. Uh, and this is not unlike what MAPC showed, by the way. We think that that would be a great transition from what you have now. So you don't really sense that as, an, as a point of entry, but it could become, again, a place and a destination. Uh, we can talk a lot about how to negotiate scale, but these are, these are the economics will drive this, uh, and there are design ways that you can find uh, a way to ameliorate that. So here's just one way, and there's lots of different ways that this area could be transformed, but this is one way that we started to try to pull these different elements together. So again, here we are uh, on the, in the site. Interestingly enough, and we didn't realize this, Gene brought this to our attention, uh, so here's the light department building, right here's the worst intersection in the world. Uh, there is a, a public easement right of way that's about 20 feet wide that zigzags. It's just a condition of the idiosyncratic nature of how things develop, but that's actually already there. What we're suggesting is, is that Pond Meadow Drive actually continue through and connect that. That was that perspective I was showing from here looking that way where you're seeing the cupola. So if we just this is a this was this is under study, right? This was, let's forget about that for a second. Uh, you basically have a amalgamation of lots of different uses. I'm I'm sorry, maybe uh, Peter, I shouldn't have said light industrial. I know you do a lot of other things, but it's a general term. Okay, uh, you know, municipal. There's this sort of office. This is really light industrial. Uh, also, municipal residential creeps up. There's a new house going in here on Ash Street. This is retail, but it you know, it erodes very quickly. It's not Main Street retail, it becomes suburban. So you gotta think about that. But what we're suggesting is that you don't try to ameliorate those uses, but you actually think ways to bring the uses together. More mixed use, more walkable. Uh, office is fine in this area, or light industrial. Friend can continue for generations. Uh, you know, this, this can stay as well if you could find a way to just to negotiate some right of way in order to make that more of an address. That's the issue as an urban designer. If you don't have an address, you actually don't have a development parcel. What these areas lack, in my mind, is a sense of an address, a sense of place. And that's what a new street or a, a right-of-way might bring you. So this is how a person navigates currently this magenta line by car. Uh, as again, you can't really get from here to here uh, by car. You can't really, you're not supposed to drive back there. Um, we feel like if this was to be residential, close to the dentist's office and near the transit. It could be three stories, uh, separate buildings, actually not unlike what you have closer to the, to the rail station. Uh, if the, uh, that building were to go away, you might, you might want to define that as a square. So this should be a community project. I would try to find a way to focus this and let that be an anchor. And even if that was the only thing that was done for the next three years, that would be a big deal. Uh, however, if we think a little bit farther, this is the uh, cutlery. They have a parcel right here, and they were looking to expand south. And if that were to happen, here's where this notion of some type of access or alignment would be possible. Does everyone see that? It's a little bit too small, but the problem is connectivity. And if you're, if you're a neighborhood resident, you actually don't want connectivity because you interpret that as traffic. Uh, however, if you're an urbanist or you're sort of thinking about the broader town network, you actually do want to get some way to access through that site. So we're suggesting uh, uh, that right of way that currently exists at zigzags could be straightened out and so that you actually do have a view of that building. 
the second move is that this notion of can these waterways, can the hydrology, can the environmental conditions be aggregated together in a manner that actually creates a sense of place, that you're actually driving into more of a campus environment? And that, the answer is yes. That would take some time to think through, but that could be a landscape uh, that actually becomes a really nice terminus to New Crossing Road uh, here, especially if uh, the, the uh, public works were to sort of aggregate somewhere else. And then you could imagine these buildings are about the size of the Weston and Sampson building, another way to expand the economy of, of, of your downtown. We think that would be a good thing. Uh, and I probably should start stop there because Bob uh, chastised me for <laughs> drawing on your property. Uh, so just close your eyes for a second. But we're thinking, you know, it could could this eventually over time be more of a campus? And you know, I, I should have I made the mistake. We should have just shown an addition if you were to grow. Uh, so just think about it in that way. But the idea that this becomes more of a campus setting, a new casting road. But there is a way to get through. Uh, so. One interpretation would be that now if you're driving, you can drive New Crossing Road through this shared street. It's not a highway. It's a 22-foot slow-moving traffic with crosswalks and come out on the Ash Street. That's one opportunity. The bike lane could continue and connect over and obviously through to the train station. Uh, therefore, the open spaces, all of this asphalt could actually become dedicated green space. Uh, the building program and the uses, if this is office and uh, uh, light industrial, housing, cultural use here, connect the waterways, actually. Try to make them into amenity and shape it. Um, so that's the site plan, but knowing that we don't want to have the plan die uh, because of traffic, Another interpretation is that actually this street doesn't go through, and you actually think about that building as a cultural use or even a, let's say, a public use that could have plazas and open spaces and you don't circulate through. That would also be an option. So this would need to be studied in terms of circulation and traffic. But we think either way, this is a really a great place to begin. It was Aaron's notion of calling it the yard. So new crossing road was the first term, right? And then gateway, maybe it is the yard because in fact that is sort of a little bit what you have now. This is work we did at, we're did. we doing in Andover actually where they are trying to move their town yard out and their four acres right on the train station now is going to be redeveloped. And so we're helping them think through how to brand that. Uh, Reading definitely could have a great potential. To my earlier point that this isn't happening in a vacuum, this was the MAPC study. So just to orient you again, here's Ash Street. Uh, here's the light building. They were showing some of these buildings being demolished. We think they could actually stay. Uh, there's a lot of pavement here. I think too much pavement. And my sense is that this development is probably unlikely given the cost of that land and the cost of redevelopment. So we're showing a little bit bigger development, but not that different. So this is where planning matters, and it matters if it builds on one another. We think this was a really good springboard. Uh, so obviously you've got the Reading 2020 vision. This is advancing the vision. We're trying to drill down and think about the transformation of these sites. I'm just realizing that clock doesn't work because I, <laughs> I know I'm running out of time, but it seems like it just started. Uh, uh, you've got the DPW, the regional DPW facility. So there's lots of things happening. Um, the transportation, uh, the Walker's Brook uh, corridor study that Gene mentioned. There's a lot of things happening. We're working in Dayton, doing the exact same thing. This is along the former canal corridor. This was the uh, Miami and Erie Canal that went through here. These are old, funky, derelict buildings that could be cool art maker spaces, uh, brew pubs, bacon beer, whatever that was, uh, because you can't recreate this stuff. It actually has an allure and, and has some redevelopment potential. So again, going a little bit too far because we haven't had this specific conversation with the property owners, but there are relatively inexpensive things that could be done, even in the short term, even with the uses remaining, that would make the buildings, I think, more uh, impressionable. And that might mean having access points or thinking about uh, lighting or signage or even having some uh, rain gardens or landscape buffers so it's not asphalt from edge to edge. Uh, this building, which who knows, I'm sorry, who knows what's happening in there. I, I, <laughs> I don't know, but it could be a thousand. <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> what is it? It's a 
garage. That's a garage, yeah. So it could be a garage forever. Uh, it could also be a pretty cool little maker space or a cafe or who knows what could happen. But we're showing some signage, some lighting, uh, pavers, uh, increasing the transparency, uh, the electric. Uh, these Again, this use, these uses could remain, but there's some landscape interventions that would start to change the character. And maybe if the you know landowners were thinking about a transformation over time, uh, it would start to move it more quickly. Uh, or here, even the, the night uh, I wanted to call them the Knife Brothers, that's not right. <laughs> the three. Northeast Cutlery. Northeast Cutlery, right. Uh, we walked in there, we had an hour tour, it was awesome. And I just wish you could see that from the outside. And if you could, if you had some larger opening windows and you see you know, the men and women sharpening their blades, that's cool. People like to see that stuff. I would just say blow out some windows, put in a cool neon sign, and you know, brand it even more. All right, so. Uh, I guess what we're saying is we think you've got a great a lot of assets here. And we don't think it needs a bold visionary plan that demolishes it all. We think the conversations with these property owners obviously need to be drilled down much more specific. So don't take umbrage with us taking license because that's what we do. But we think this notion of connectivity and creating a place here at an art center really would be a remarkable um, way to grow your downtown. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have so many questions. Yeah. First of all, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. So, Jean, um, I know you've been working on this. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, from a moving forward perspective, how do you see this unfolding? Because there are about two dozen different variables that I see as moving parts for this vision. Um, what's What's your take? Okay. Well, we really wanted to hear your feedback. Um, <laughs> but um, w what we do in planning is we put some ideas together. And thank you, David. That was an excellent presentation that captured the ideas that we've been talking about, that we've talked to the property owners and the business owners about. Um, and now seeing it visually, you can get a sense of where this could be headed. Before we do anything, we wanted to come to this board to make sure that we were on the right track, for starters. And um, so that's why we wanted to hear your feedback. And then I know there's lots of people in the audience that probably want to make comments. Um, but we don't like to go too far until we check in with the ideas that we have developed. And that, that check-in is critical because we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we could, once we get consensus, that we could move forward. For starters, we have a economic development summit planned for October 23rd. We plan, if, if this board thinks we're on the right track, we're planning to open it up to community input at that meeting broadly and invite, um, this, is, this will be the third annual Economic Development Summit that we'll be hosting, and invite anybody and everybody to the library to come and um, hear about this, hear about the traffic study, and um, have some interactive uh, breakout sessions with the public. Again, that check-in with the public is, is crucial mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. So I guess before, my, the immediate question is, um, with this vision, um, have I, I know that the, there's many of the business owners in the audience. Um, what has their input been, or what has RMLD's input been? Because obviously, while there are steps that should we want to move forward with this vision the town could take, there's a lot of collaboration that would need to happen and buy-in from those that are going to be directly affected. There's, there's all the existing property owners. There's all the people that live in the Ash Street neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We've had them out as part of the Economic Development Action Plan. We invited everybody in that neighborhood to a meeting uh, about, about four or five years ago. And we were surprised. It was down at RMLD. Some of you might remember it. We were surprised mm -hmm. that we got as many people. We got 60 people. And people thought we were 
on the right track. But again, I would want to check in because that neighborhood is going to be the most impacted and would want to hear from them. Um, uh, this area was, was a uh, PDA, um, which is not what you normally think PDA is. It's Priority Development Area. area. Um, in the in the December 2015 yes. Economic Development Action Plan for 2016 to 2022, and it, they sort of presented it in there as uh, pack more into the space. I, that's what, the way I read it. Um, it but I, I like this this uh, option or idea of keeping it keeping more open space mm -hmm. and keeping the existing buildings that are there. Um, but to follow on Vanessa's question, what is you've you've obviously spoken to the the landowners. Um, they'll be critical um, to this. This if if we want to do this. Um, have you had positive feedback from them? Uh, or uh, well, I don't. I mean. We've sat down and we've talked about ideas moving forward. This is the first time they've seen this. Yeah. Uh, so maybe they're not too crazy about it now. I don't know. But um, when we sat with them and met with them, everybody was very collaborative, very mm -hmm. interested in this kind of an idea. Um, you know, so we were very encouraged by that. That's, that's great. That's great. Other, other questions for the board before I have a couple comments? John? Um, so it's time and money. I mean, that's, you talk about it being generational. I mean, you've got four or five businesses represented in this room mm -hmm. who own the property and they don't just own the property. You know, they've got going concerns. So then when you start to think about what goes on later, I mean, the presentation is gorgeous. Okay? You know, it would be great. Um, I'm a person that is in and out of that spot a lot. Um, and so, you know, what you're showing is, you know, just something that is so revolutionary to what's there. Mm. Um, and it's exciting. But from a practical standpoint, um, you come back to the, to the people, and for a second, let's just say that maybe RMLD would be happier in a different space. I don't know. But they're a major player here. Um, you know, you've got that classic building, the historic building sitting there. Um, I'm not sure what's going on in there other than it's sitting there looking cool, because it really is cool. Um, the other building is a hub of activity, but does it have to be there? And if it doesn't, you know, is it equipped to go up? Because that's kind of what you probably have to do um, with that building. Um, but it, you got to come back to these business and landowners most of the landowners are the business owners so what you do when I talk about time and money I mean I know that many of those business owners are not ready to say oh sure I'll just you know do something different because frankly in Reading there's no place else to do something different if you want to stay in Reading I mean the development of commercial property is great the development of business is awesome um, but do they stay or do they go? And so that's a pretty big question, and it is a generational question. Um, and what does that do to the land value? Because the land has a certain value, the property itself. It's, it's got an assessed tax value, um, and it's the last great place when you consider it, you know, in the, in the total to um, where the DPW is and where does that go. Uh, I mean, the acreage there, we've got nothing like it left in Reading, so we got to do it right. Um, but when you, so if, uh, if one of those business owners says, you know, I think this is a great idea, it's not necessarily conducive to the way I do my business today, let me put a price on my property. They got a, a double barreled price on their property. One of them is tied to the actual value of the land and what can be done there. The second is the value of their business. I mean, if they're taking out a certain amount of profit after paying all their employees, you have to factor that in. 
So I love this idea, and I think that you got to think about it in bite-sized pieces over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. that, exa you're exactly right. If I could just suggest that to me, is this the credit union, Gene? Yeah. Yes, yeah. To me, if, if there was, a, let's say, a southern flank strategy, I would study this, the viability of a reuse for that. And to me, this site is, is really key. And I feel like it's underutilized. If you got some housing here, that would at least make this portion of Ash Street uh, a catalyst. And to me, that building could stay. It actually looks pretty good for a 1980s office building. So that is one thing. The, the, then the next, the key thing I could think is this move. If the cutlery would be interested in sort of finding a way to switch their interests here, then a connection could be made and it doesn't, this could even stay in its current use, but that would at least allow the beginnings of some type of network. So I, I feel like you could probably chunk it out into three parts. Mm. But it is over a long period of time. Uh, this, would be a, this would be a 20 year yeah. plan. And it's it's time and money is really what it is. I just want to comment on that. Clearly there's landowners and business owners here that can uh, express their own opinions, but I do want to share with you that we just discussed at length with most of them, if not all of them, a long-term strategy. Some of them have a generational interest in keeping the business going. Some do not. Some have employees beyond their family. Some do not. So what they may want to say tonight may not you know, be quite the same as what they shared with us. But we absolutely looked at a very long horizon. Yeah. And the most important thing, to me at least, was none of you have to leave tomorrow. That's just not a, a factor. The MAPC stuff was a lot of you are going to have to leave. Well, that that called for blowing everything up and right. starting yeah. over, which right. didn't. Never, I love the idea of developing the you know the land, but yeah. I didn't love the idea of blowing everything up and starting over again. It just yeah. didn't seem to make sense to me. So um, one of the things that I think can really help us in the next discussion we're going to have about an economic development committee, um, it just really fits in very nicely. One of the things I think we're missing still is this vision of how to market the space. If you were to come to us and say, yeah, this is awesome, you're going to do it, the town's going to put up all the money and get it done, there's no discussion, right? We're not going to be able to do that. There's got to be some public-private partnership here, and we need some help with the vision, ideally from local residents and others who know about commercial real estate development, who can help us figure out how to market the different places and spaces mm -hmm. to work with the different businesses that are here. And, and Bob, you said you know, some maybe are upgrades. You showed a beautiful vision, I think, of the cutlery with windows and all sorts of things. You know, how it all plays out are great discussions to have. But I think that there's this kind of almost one level up of kind of saying, how do we market Reading? How do we market this wonderful opportunity? We know we've got this space. We've got some other potential areas to connect also. How do we get that done? Um, and, and Gene, answering your question too, when you know when do all the different things come in? Great to get the input, great to keep it coming in, great to have an ongoing source of the input. Um, I, I just, I wanna, I guess I wanna go even higher than this first before coming down and kind of saying, okay, what's, what's, the, what's the grand plan? Taking what we already have, complementing it with the folks who say, here's how you do it, here's how you, that you create whatever it is the space is going to be. I love the campus concepts. I think they're absolutely spot on. I think that would be such a, a wonderful thing to be able to have. I'm, I'm starting to think about, let, let's kind of go higher first and then get the, how do you orchestrate? Oh, we talked to a couple of larger, I guess, developers, and this would be a modest project for them. And when I say this, I mean including the Danis property on the other side of the train tracks. Um, so you take a much bigger bite. Yep. Um, typically, those developers would come up with a very different image. They would knock everything down, or almost everything down. And then they would do that. Right. If they had all the property. If they had all the property. So that was three, four years ago. That was one option to look at. And um, we just didn't think that something like that would move forward effectively in Reddit. Um, if it was more f removed from neighborhoods, maybe. Um, and it's not terrible for neighborhoods, but the Ash Street is. So we, we really have divided it up into pieces, and this piece is first. But you're exactly right about the overview and the marketing of it is, do you need to start with this and not know what the rest of it is or not? That's an open question, right? 
No, no. no it's more, it's more the market will drive what it needs yeah. to be from there. Yeah. You know, when we, several years ago, when we saw the MAPC um, rendering, we started, you remember, we started yeah. nosing around and we had visits with developers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was interesting what we heard. Uh, one of the things you heard is that, you know, developers that want to that want to take on a big project like that want to optimize their investment. A, want to invest minimally. B, they tend to be bottom feeders. There's nothing in Reading that's you know worthy of being a bottom feeder as far as land acquisition is concerned because it's in such high demand. So, looking at it in a different way, I think actually has the opportunity to get legs growing on it, even though. There, it's over a much longer period of time. I think that's the patience is the key. It's unlike what we were able to do in smart growth. You know, we did some zoning and bang. Mm -hmm. I mean, developers were right on it because it was the market was pent up waiting for that. This, I think, is a little different. You know, it's a different look. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make it clear to the business owners in the room and who aren't in the room that, as John said, if you have a growing concern there and employing people and it's your, it's your, it's your um, career and your business, I, you know, at least I have no desire to uh, tell you to change that or, 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 you know, tell you how to run your business or change the location of your business or anything like that. It's up to you. Um, what I liked about this is that some of the some of this plan could really uh, beautify the area without uh, forcing businesses to change use or change hands or anything like that. I mean, it's a stepwise approach, and you could do some of the things that would really make the area attractive without um, asking businesses to to move elsewhere. So I think this is really exciting. I love um, the, the vision of having a more green space and more connectivity between different parts of town. Um, for, to John's point, it, it requiring time and money, I absolutely agree. But and then additionally, the buy-in from uh, different state, stakeholders who are who are there currently uh, as well. And Jean, you mentioned that there was a lot of excitement um, among. Uh, was it was it among business owners or business owners and the residents who abut the area? When we met back, when we were doing I, I wasn't I wasn't clear if that was from four to five the, the meeting from four to five years ago with this with the sixty residents or yeah that, yeah yeah I was referring to one of the community meetings when okay. we were developing the plan for this priority development area. Okay, we were pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. that the neighbors residential neighbors. Um, thought it was a good idea to go in this direction. And they thought we did a lot of um, uh, visioning in terms of um, how tall should the buildings be, and, and, and they were okay with three and four stories. Okay. And have they heard from the town in the last four or five years about this, or are they, are they going to be hearing kind of tonight? Is the we, we've had the Economic Development Summit for the last Mm -hmm. This will make it the third year. Mm -hmm. So that is our big outreach effort okay. to invite the community to come and see what we're working on. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had lots of uh, other public meetings that we've talked about, planning meetings and charrettes and um, certainly the public hearings at CPDC and such. Mm -hmm. So I think there's been a lot of discussion, but um, to your point, I think you can never have too much community involvement right, when right, you start right. talking about a plan like this. So will they receive a mailing of some yes. kind about? They will okay. get a direct mailing. Okay. We have we, that's the database that we used mm -hmm. back four or five years ago. We're going to get the update on that list mm -hmm. and invite all the neighbors on Ash Street, Cross Street, okay. uh, uh, Brook Street. Uh, and I'm forgetting one, but there's one more. Um, Avon. Avon, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we would invite them all because they are really impacted by yes. this. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so, just to chime in, I mean, I think it's um, the last discussions that we had heard was the idea of, sort of bulldozing everything and, and having it developed. And I think this is, frankly, more practical and more. Um, desirable, both from a community perspective, um, 
and as far as the town being able to retain control over how it's developed, um, as opposed to selling off the land and having a developer do what they want, because to John's point, they want to do what's cheapest and is going yep. to net them the biggest investment. So, um, As far as next, well, why don't I open up to public comment? Can I just make one oh, sure. comment and then I'll absolutely the public. I just want to point out, and the reason I pulled up this map, and I think we've sort of say, said it, but I want to be very clear. When you look at the geography of this area and how close it is to downtown, I think that's important to keep in mind. And you can see the, um, the, the overall gateway area and then the downtown area, and to John's point, where we expanded the Smart Growth District. Um, these are adjacent areas. We call it the bow tie. They're adjacent. And what we're doing with Reimagine Reading in the downtown isn't separate and distinct from what we're doing in the Eastern Gateway in terms of planning and anticipating connectivity and bike lanes and family events and cultural activity. We feel like those two go hand in hand, those two areas. You know, I think one of the things to, to that point, Gene, is that people don't think about it being close for a very special reason because the worst <laughs> traffic corner in the world yes. is there. Yes. Um, the, the traffic patterns matter substantially to anything that could happen here. You know, because it's not just the people on Ash Street, because it dumps out in another direction, <clears throat> you know, where there's another big project going on over on Lakeview. I mean, so, I mean, this stuff is all, I mean, the, the connectivity of all of this, you almost have to look at it from an aerial view mm -hmm. in order to be able to come to terms with that because those of us that have lived in Reading for a very long time, um, many people in this room have lived their whole life here. I'm a short timer, only 30 years, but um, you don't think about the connection between here and downtown because it doesn't connect. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you don't think about can you get there from what's now Walker's Brook because you're driving through a parking lot and alley, you know, and you're in you're fighting a light that is improperly placed. It's a there's a holistic view of this that has to happen. It's got to be more than just what we saw tonight. The traffic, the traffic and parking matters in, mm. in 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 the thought of a project like this. And I'll add that I mean that's crossing 28, so that's not an intersection that we as a town can. Influence well, at the tracks, we can influence it. That at the tracks, yes, yeah. but the cross on to the other side of Maine. I'm not sure who actually owns the worst intersection in the world, but it could be us. Yeah. No, we may be able. To, we right. can't control the so, speed, but so why don't we open it up to public comment now? If anyone, yes, Colleen. Hi, Colleen O'Brien, general manager of Colonial Gate. Having us, I have with me the Fire Assistant Director, who's also in charge of facilities. Um, yeah, I guess I came to the RMLD just when the MAPC had done their previous study. And the RMLD, uh, at that time, before I had gotten there, had done some facility studies on that antique building. And I, I'm glad to share that with everyone. I think bringing it up to code at that time was a little bit more than $2 million. But since the MAPC, and we're more than happy to move, but I think when we went through the MAPC, people didn't realize that we have 51 trucks, 20 bucket trucks, and we have over a million dollars worth of electric assets uh, that feed our entire system. That's where our stocking system is. So all of that would have to be considered and moved. Um, in addition to that, we just happened to be uh, renovate that parking lot up front. I know. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, you know, we, we, because we didn't know if we were going to be knocked down or not, we've been repairing them. It's been really difficult uh, not to spend any money to try to fix anything. The thing we really spent money on was the air conditioning system because it failed. Uh, our back deck is condemned, so we're actually taking it apart and just putting in uh, a little, uh, some pavers and things like that where the employees can sit but we're not rebuilding the deck. Um, so we've been mindful of this plan, and you know, from an economic development standpoint, we certainly, as your utility, want to have more sales. Uh, but this parking lot happens, it was, has been approved, it's been bid, it's gone through all of the permitting and everything, and construction is like next week. 
So that's a little bit of a problem. Now, the point of the parking lot is because, again, the severe drainage system problems, uh, the, uh, the icing, we lose a bunch of spots. The half of that area is not even usable. We got a grant for electric vehicle stanchions that we have on the side that are supposed to come out front. Uh, it is also part of a beautification so that there'd be all landscaping trees out the front. And I would think that even if it became a cultural center, you'd still want to have some kind of parking because in the back, because that's where we store a lot of our stuff, we also have nerve security. So we have gates up and stuff that we we have to move uh, or really take a look at what it is that, how we operate. Um, in the MAPC plan, they had us out back in a seven-story building. I made the same comments, and they put all the trucks down underneath in like a first um, floor garage area. And that worked perfectly. I didn't know if people would want to walk around a reflecting pond with us driving around with our bucket trucks, but it was okay with me, because it was great. Um, so I just want to be completely transparent about what's happening. I don't want everyone here to be excited about something. I want you to remain excited, but I also want you to know that the contractors are showing up to fix the parking lot. Now, it's not a lot of money, and it is going to help. I mean, I don't, I'm hearing that this probably isn't going to happen for 10 years, so in the interim, at least we'll have some spots. Um, the, the credit union is only about 200 square feet, so they do park there, and it's for customers and vendors, and we have a lot of training. We've got the largest utility in the state, so we have a lot of people coming in and out for, for training that we sponsor and stuff like that. So between that and the nurse security parking out back, we're still, most of the time, overflowing during business hours. So that's where I stand. I'll be glad to pass along that, uh, that report. Uh, site facilities plan on that historic building. It's probably seven or eight years old, and I, I'm glad to pass it along if you don't already have a copy to take a look at it. So if you have any input for me, please let me know, especially if you want me to call the contractor. Yes, this, I need to do it tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Other public comment? Gloria. So again, we have to read for the street. So when did when you were showing the whole area, the eastern gateway, it's kind of so much larger than what we saw with some little corn being considered developed. So I'm just wondering, was it considered that you always like on the other side of the uh, tracks? You have these boarded windows, and, you know, the back of uh, yes. But but it can be a beautiful building with a tall chimney and so on. So is there any? I don't know, thinking about it, and I don't know, my, most of my neighbors are here, and maybe we kind of, we didn't expect such an idle fact focus. We really hope to see more of, uh, I don't know, access points, how the whole area is in vision. So I'm just wondering, is, is this happening? We're not there yet, um, but we hope to be. The, um, the, when we started this and we started meeting with all the property owners, um, the area you're talking about, one general way where the market basket is and that whole area, in our plan back in 2015, we identified that as a priority development area. And when we met with the property owner, um, we started to realize that maybe the timing of what our thinking was didn't match with what that property owner was thinking. They they were very happy with leaving it the way it is, and they weren't that really that interested in um, seeing some forward movement. So that's why we shifted to look at the yard as an area that we could do this kind of thing. Um, the other piece of it is um, we really want to get that Green International report under our belt so that we can start thinking about the defects that we know that are in the infrastructure. We know we have that horribly defective intersection at the end of Ash in Maine. And we know that the intersection or the, the entrance to Market Basket is terrible. So we know we have two really big defects that we have to fix <coughs> somehow and come up with some other ways of looking at these things and other ways of designing them. Um, and our, our real hope is that we could go to the state and apply for a Mass Works grant to make these infrastructure improvements so that the town is taking the lead on infrastructure and sort of setting the table for what the future could be for redevelopment in that over, overall area. Because I think over time, it's going to happen 
and being queued up for it is, is one of our main goals is being queued up for opportunities. So it's a long-winded answer to yes, we do see this whole area as a target area, um, but we want to go slow and we want to go slow so that we can go fast. So, so what do you expect that the traffic study is going to so with the October meeting, we're going to talk, we're going to bring David back, and we're going to bring Green International back. And we're going to, I don't know if they'll have a lot to share with us at that point, but whatever they have, we're going to bring it back to that forum so that everybody can understand the kinds of things we're looking at, talking about, and that kind of thing. So we'll have something in another month. Well. Just for Coriana, the other thing, despite my interest and my best efforts, um, we weren't going to be building over the train tracks and connecting those two parcels. It just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So to the extent they're two distinct parcels, we can treat them as such. So actually, my um, what I'm really interested in is, is whether you can connect Market Basket to the new crossing road, because I, yeah. that makes lots of sense. Yeah, but absolutely. I know it was the original proposal, which didn't happen in Ukraine. It's very difficult. So is that something Yeah, we have to? talked about that edge as a separate project, but because it didn't connect to what tonight's presentation was, at least not in the short run, maybe the, uh, the MBTA will be a little more creative in five or ten years from now, but we weren't building buildings over the train tracks, and we weren't going to be putting them another station. So once it divided into two, this was the easier parcel, and again, uh, with the property owner's uh, discussion, um, things could happen more quickly. George Danis wasn't interested in doing anything fast, but he has said he has a time horizon, and that's the other big property. <coughs> so that's probably a year or two behind in the planning process. And, you know, one of the ideas is perhaps to try to remove that uh, market basket exit entirely. Right, so that is actually, because we, we are looking into, can we, if we can have the highway traffic actually go into the mix like going rather than reaching this so maybe we can maybe we can table this for now and make that part of the PT TTF future discussion um, no, it's or green, part of green this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll be hearing more about that then. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, uh, any other public comment? Like 21 Green Street. Um, I just had a question for David. I wasn't sure. Obviously, it's a it's a, it's a vision. I think you've heard a, a lot from the board as well. I, I guess Reading is early on in this. You know, what what have you seen other communities doing to move their visions along that you have given a lot of examples of steps they've taken, whether it's advisory board, community, you know, community members, residents, the, the actual owners or summits that bring in the developers to, to see what's out there. What are the steps that other communities have taken to further a, a similar vision? It seems to me, although I haven't met with the groups individually, that there's a lot of community engagement and a lot of civic activism already. I would leverage the partnerships and the groups that you have and see if you can't corral them around ways in which this area might relate to ambitions that they have as within their groups. Uh, the public-private partnerships are spot on, I feel like. If there is a general municipal ambition to try to transform this area, working with the property owners and thinking about an incremental change, uh, that's a great start. And just taking on one or two smaller projects would be the way to go. I, I even feel like across the way, if we were to look at that bigger geography, I don't know, I just towed it up on my hand. I think there's 40,000 square feet of vacant space already. I would just lease it up with more interesting tenants uh, and not demolish that, um, that building. So I guess I would say not being afraid to work incrementally. That to me is, is ambitious. So do, do you have, presumably you, um, and you've had other examples of work that you've done or, or presented, um, what other communities can you hold up as examples that have done this successfully? Yeah, I, mean, I would have to get back to you with a list because some towns that I might mention, you may think, oh, we don't want to be like them. <laughs> I mean, well, in each town, I think there's an understanding we'll have different assets, attributes, challenges, yeah. but um, this co general concept yep. of the beautification efforts and the yep. connectivity, the mixed use, um, bringing, it, bringing the businesses on board, working with the community, the uh, public-private partnership that Mark mentioned, 
where even even if that their vision may not be ours, where have efforts similar to this been implemented successfully? Good. So I'm thinking in Watertown, uh, the, the project there where developers brought in an incubator space in an old mall, and that actually brought in a whole new tenant group, and they renovated, I don't know, 8,000 square feet. Uh, that's a small project. Massport is trying to do containers everywhere. I would honestly, I've never worked in an urban design project, Colleen, where there weren't things too far along, but I would take that $150,000 or whatever it's going to cost to repave that and let that be a tactical urbanism space where you actually bring in events and maybe that's where the arts group meets outdoors and just do things to get programming and get people get started to occupy that space without having to restripe it. That would actually be, it would change people's mindset. Um, so I, I, maybe next time or for the public meeting we should show seven or eight different projects that are appropriately scaled to ready. I think that would be helpful because um, while there's enthusiasm, I also want to make sure that it's feasible. Yep. Um, and so seeing how other towns have done this successfully would be reassuring. Um, all right, so if there's no other questions from the board, oh, do I have a question from the audience? Hi. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just going to make a comment um, on, some, on some things. Um, I worked in marketing and advertising pretty much a lot uh, as a designer and artist and stuff like that. I'm actually working with um, what's happening in Thomas Way and Movement right now which is similar to a big area that they're trying to do something similar but not as much uh, as nice as this um when you start talking about marketing and stuff like that it's just this one powerpoint presentation about everybody in this room and i'm agreeing with a lot of what everybody's saying here as far as marketing goes i think if you show people that because both sides can benefit from this. The housing on Ash Street, plus all the businesses in the area, can work together, which usually all of, Stanley, you might be able to speak on this too, it's, it's a bipartisan on both sides to really bring this together. If something looks really nice like that for both sides, it's it's a given, like what you were saying about marketing stuff like that. People will want to join in and get themselves involved with things. And there's ways of making it. So over the years, it changes, naturally, because visions change and things happen uh, in everything. So sometimes it changes a little bit. But the overall look of the whole thing here, to me, fascinated me alone as an artist, as a designer. Uh, I work with, if you remember, in um, Boston, the financial district was in chaos years and years ago. And what they did is they brought artisans in. And artisans built that up so that now all of a sudden the financial district is what it is now. Then, then the artisans moved to, was it South Boston or something in Boston? But it's all part of a procedure. You start off with good ideas like this, and you can build build on that. It's not going to happen overnight, like you said, but it's. I think it will progress, especially something like this. This sounds enormous. This sounds very uh, tempting to, I think, a lot of residences and businesses in the area, and they should get in on it, I believe. That's the whole marketing concept that I see. So okay. thank you for listening. Thank you. All right. Gene, any other comments or? That's it for me. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Folks. Thank you. Um, why don't we take a five minute break? Yeah.
Institute's mission ideas and develop an approach for feedback and eventual implementation of the uh, EDC. We spoke with uh, past Reading EDC members and some community members at large um, to get their ideas on sort of where the EDC could go. Um, we explored discussions of the EDC mission um, that was um, that included that 2016-2022 uh, action plan that we were just re referring to and past select board meetings. Um, we also looked primarily, Mark, at other communities with EDC type organizations to learn best practices. Um, and then we want to share our, our thinking with the full board and request feedback. Um, after that, we will reach out to town staff, boards, and committees for their input, um, and then return with recommendation for an establishment of the EDC. Is that fast enough? Yes, thank you. I'm done. Cool. So, where are we? Uh, we did the interviews that Andy talked about with some past EDC members. Um, we've looked at the policies um, and also talking about kind of what, what worked and what didn't in the past. We want to understand you know, why it stopped, how, how things, what things were good, what things weren't good. So, we wanted to kind of ferret that out a little bit. Uh, we looked a little bit at some other boards and committees' charters because we're not looking to be du duplicative of any <coughs> activities. We're trying to be complementary to what's going on. Um, we've done some interviews now with economic development people, sorry for the term, in other <laughs> communities. <laughs> some completed, some still to go. Um, and then we kind of drafted, sort of draft mission and composition. But what I thought we would do is kind of share with you a little bit of the, the background, some of the ideas, and see what thoughts you have. This is actually a page from that um, MEPC study that was done back in 2016. And if you kind of go down to 4C, you can see my, my beautiful circle around it. Um, they talked about identifying a team of individuals in the town who can champion economic development and serve as, as liaison. And that's one of the things that we, we thought we could really add with this group that we're talking about here. So, for feedback, structurally, this is what we were talking about. A volunteer board of local professionals, prof re residents, they're both residents and professionals is the point, sorry, passionate about guiding and promoting balanced long-term economic development in town. They would bring expertise to this area, they bring buy-in. What I mean by that is um, having these experts being residents and bringing this information to the town, I think, gets them <coughs> even more engaged in what we're doing and helps take it forward. Similar thinking in a lot of ways to the permanent building committee structure in terms of how that's set up um, and the notion of having this ongoing group and ongoing set of communications. It would be a full town scope. So it's downtown, it's Eastern Gateway, it's South Main, it's North Main, it's everything. And it's, it's not just Main, it's beyond the yard. <laughs> the yard and more. Um, the kind of expertise we're looking for would be commercial real estate, development, marketing, retail. So these are folks who could help us market the town. So as we're talking about these visionary plans, there's a way to be talking to people on a regular basis, bringing in regular input, and helping to structure what it is that we take forward to get folks to work with us in doing this activity. Uh, the group would report to the select board. It would be complementary to town staff and existing boards and committees. Again, not duplicative. Um, in talking with some folks in, in other communities, they suggested to think in three time horizons. I'll just briefly mention it. A short term, one to three years, a medium term, three to five, and then the long term, which is five plus and could be out to 20 as we're talking about it. Be composed of five to seven people with diverse backgrounds, interests, and expertise. Uh, economic development director would be an active participant um, and non-voting member, and that's the exact structure in Lexington. Um, and I, I did have a chance to speak with the economic development director in Lexington, and um, she was very um, complimentary of how it worked. In fact, I asked her, if you were in a different community and had the opportunity to create it the way you'd like to, how might you do that? Mm. <laughs> so, seven concepts on the mission. Number one, guide the select board to help establish long-term town economic development goals, taking advantage of existing work and resources, which would include, and this is not meant to be a full list, the things that we've already done. Uh, the MEPC, MEPC study, peer study 2017, master plan of 2005. Um, the resources would be economic development director, planning department, boards and committees, and the elements that they'd be working on could include things like tax base, workforce development, housing, sustainability, preparing the town for the next Direction. So it's next generation. Next generation. Thank you. Next direction. 
new direction. Yeah, I think you know the group. Yeah. One direction. Yeah, one direction. That's it. Uh, provide regular business, professional, and community perspective and guidance on townwide economic development. So this would be an ongoing group that would be meeting on a, on a somewhat regular basis. Three, to be a valuable resource to prospective businesses, current businesses, town staff, town boards, and committees through providing formalized recommendations and suggestions on implementation that enhance economic development. So we'd be leaning on these folks um, and asking them to make a very significant contribution uh, in terms of what's happening. It, it's, we're getting advice and we're asking them to, to kind of formally come back to us with their thoughts on what and how to do it. Number four, EDC shall be notified by the Economic Development Director of significant economic development proposals before the town with the intent to be able to report to the SB Select Board with a review, evaluations, and suggestions recommendation. Again, lifted directly from Lexington and very specific to on a particular project to make sure we have formal recommendations coming back from this group. Number five, maintain an ongoing dialogue between resident EDC members and business owners and owners of major properties on a proactive basis. I know that many people in town are already doing this uh, in a lot of ways. This would be having this citizen group, if you will, um, of professionals, experts, kind of being in that mix and spending time with these folks as well. Not to be negotiating with them per se, but to kind of have a very good understanding of what's happening and how things can work together. Number six, when requested by the board, sorry, it's this from somebody else. When requested by the select board, review economic development incentives for specific commercial development proposals. Um, so there is an activity called TIFs, tax increment financing, that could involve pushing taxes to different time frames. The point is that to have this as a tool in the toolkit, and to have a group of professionals able to offer advice on it might be very helpful and even potentially to establish some guidelines. This is not saying that this is something we have to do. It's a suggestion that um, it could be an interesting way to get some of these public-private partnerships moving forward. Um, it was brought up by a number of people, uh, past EDC members as well as people in other communities. Um, number seven, coordinate work with other relevant boards and committees on economic development issues to enhance effectiveness and avoid redundancy. The last thing we want to do is to bring in a new piece of, of hierarchy or, or, or whatever that just kind of gets in the way. This is to bring in some new perspectives to work with the other groups and to help get this thing done. I'll go back in a second. So the next steps would be get some feedback from you folks continue other community activities, start talking with town staff boards and committees, and then to come back ideally in November with a recommended mission and structure for the board to debate and approve. That's the presentation. If there are particular things that, good, bad, or otherwise, would love to, to get your feedback. So, thank you for that and for putting it together. Very thorough. Uh, I'm curious what our staff have to say because I feel like they have been, if not to put you on the spot, uh, put, put you on the spot. Um, you have been actively involved, Gene, especially um, in economic development in town. Um, so, and I know um, Bob, you would have worked with and Gene, I think, as well, the previous EDC. So, I'm curious um, what your thoughts are overall on this, if this is something you're talking about. I just, I just want to start by saying it's somewhat of an unfair question because this is the first time we're all seeing it. Right. right. Just like you. So, yeah. okay. I talked to Mark briefly last week and I said, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I don't know what you're up to, but I think it should look like the permanent building committee. And he said, already figured that out. I said, <laughs> and we, we don't need to talk anymore. If you're there, then not to it. And that's going to make demands on who you, who you bring that committee yes and that is really the difference um, you know that committee is so I think highly functional yeah. even though it hasn't had anything really to it's had things to look at but they all have their specialty they make fun of each other but they respect each other specialty yeah. and they work together great and they continue to talk and meet yeah um, and if you want that to happen you know you kind of got to go back to you know one of your bullets was who you were gonna, yeah. who you were gonna get, and that matters. We have a lot of people capital in this town. Uh, we do. You got to dig them out, though. I mean, we have yeah. Yeah. we have many volunteers that say, "Hey, I, I want to help. How can I help you?" And they come and they help you any way they can. Oh, you sure? I'll go on the economic development committee. Oh, well, yeah, that's not quite. That isn't the way. 
I mean, yeah. you have to, I personally think you've got to find those people that actually have that kind of skill set that you're talking about. Um, you know, you got to have somebody that understands what a TIF is because every place where there's development going on, that's going on. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there are. We need to elevate our sophistication level if we're going to do this right. Um, which, interestingly, you know, the as the sunset was, as the sun was setting on the last economic development committee, they present one of their members presented a letter that kind of. I'm sure you've read it that said just that you know we lack the right horses yeah. pulling the wagon yeah you know or, or a tool in the toolkit yeah. yeah i think that's right and i think i think you're right about it's going to be a challenge to find the right people and they're going to have to have some passion to want to do this really commit to getting it done i did have a couple of people bend my ear interestingly at the, at the downtown meeting mm -hmm. um, about you know, what we're doing right and wrong and, and you know, may or may not have the background but I think once you get to first. once you get to the you, obviously some of this you've you get the best ideas you steal them from somebody else because you know why reinvent something and mm -hmm. there's not, not a thing in the world wrong with doing that in my opinion you go where it's successful I mean you were in Lexington drive through their downtown sometime I mean, you know, it's pretty stunning what happens there and the amount, the diversity of businesses that are there, how busy they are, how long they last, and yep. they understand TIF. Yep. Okay. So and from uh, can I just add, they're doing another project. So their second area is Hartwell Avenue. And so yeah. that's what they're working on now is how to really get that rock. So from another, if I can chime in here, um, from a next steps perspective, what do you see as your action items? So um, we'd love for you, I, our hope was to get this to you in advance and we failed, so I apologize for that. But um, over the course of some short period of time to get feedback from you folks on likes, dislikes, whatever. Um, I'd like to talk to a few more communities. Um, I think, David, you may even have some ideas for me in terms of who to talk to, which would be great. And then I'd like to talk internally um, with folks. Again, this is not meant to, to uh, it's not a takeover, and it's not meant to be duplicative. It's meant to kind of add some new perspective and have this ongoing committee, a lot of the permanent building committee, um, that can be this, this beacon that really helps us with economic development. And do you see them as being advisory in their capacity? I think advisory, but I'm going to be very careful with that term. We got a lot of feedback from the past members that at, at a certain point, probably toward the end, uh, they felt superfluous, not listened to, etc. And I think this is a big job. I think it's a, a really important activity and I think that we they, they deserve to be listened to. So yes, they're advisory, but I think you know, the, the idea of some, some formality in reports and things like that was purposeful. Other thoughts from the board? Would, the, would you, the thing you would be that they would be advisory, but empowered to, to act on their own to a certain extent without getting our, um, go, our, would we have to, you know, sign off on everything they do or, would they be able, would be, they be empowered to go and do and? I, I mean, to me, it's, uh, they're empowered to do, we're telling, we're suggesting to them what we want and they're mm -hmm. empowered to come back with formal reports saying this is okay. what we think you should do. Report back to the board. And then it comes to the board to decide to take those recommendations or to work with, and to work with town staff to take the recommendations. But they, they don't have power beyond that. They can't commit us to doing things. Are they going to be proactively marketing? Or are they going to say, this is how we would recommend the town market itself? It certainly starts with that. And I think at some point they would recommend, OK, how do you do it and who's going to do it? And I think we have a discussion at that point about how to do it. But I think the missing one of the missing pieces we have right now is that discussion on how to how to market the town, how to view Reading and the economic opportunity, and how to use that to help us do development and, and get things going. And, and my personal vision is that that's a lot of what these folks start with. And this would be this would be a resident, a board of residents that live in town, mm -hmm. and. Um, are under the select board 
and can work both complementary, complementary, and synergistically with town staff, and, and I think it could create some ideas and um, uh, feedback to us that will. Um, really help keep the economic development in town something that the residents um, are comfortable with. And to be clear, the staff is leading the implementation of the activities. This isn't yeah. that. No. So the format is very similar to the permanent building committee? Yeah, extremely so. <laughs> uh, can I just ask you a question? Sure. Um, with the other EDC, they spent a lot of time on like small grants, mm -hmm. and um, we are all grant writers. That's professionally what we do, and so we were always surprised that um, that that the volunteers were doing what the professional staff is trained to do. So, how do we avoid those kind of collisions in a, in a scenario like this? First of all, I, I think that if you know a volunteer board can get a grant, that's great. Um, and I, I think some of those grants really help beautify um, uh, part of the downtown. I, I think, though, um, communication is the key to prevent duplicative work. You know, um, and I mean, I think we we saw tonight more communication like with RMLD and their parking renovation plans we need more lines of communication um, and yeah and I think it's a good thing for us to talk about when we sit down right. for the next step right. yeah because often we didn't know that they were applying for these grants there's no desire to have two different groups doing mm, the same thing yeah. yeah that's a bad idea John? So, uh, you know, you have professional staff here that do are working on all these things. So, you know, I'm here to work on that economic development action plan, and I know we've talked about this, Mark, and I, I do think that that's an important next step is to be utilizing your staff. 100%. Yeah, 100%. This yeah. isn't meant to supplant anything at all. In fact, hopefully it's informing. It's coming back and it's getting some of these perspectives, using these relationships, helping with the marketing. But, you know, speaking for myself, and you're here, you had some very specific, you know, missions to accomplish. This is to help. But there's an expectation that the economic development director would be reporting to the select board or to the uh, EDC. No, uh, just inform them of uh, uh, non-voting member, non-voting yeah. member, and also to keep them abreast of what's happening in town, so that you can. I see this as something that's going to amplify your impact on the town. I would hope that that person would not, that Aaron would not be reporting to such a committee. No, no, I mean no, that no. can't happen. That was never I, suggested. I, I don't think that was it. Well, that's the, that's the sense that, that there's a takeaway sense, you know, from town staff. I think this, this is a great. I, I think this is a really good rough draft of where you're going and where we would like to go. It needs to really get sharpened. Mm -hmm. um, it needs to get defined so that everybody knows who does what. And, it, and, and then once you've done that, I would suggest that you host a you host a little workshop for people that might be interested in serving on such a committee create a competition for you know such a committee uh, and let's see if we can't you know turn the rocks over and get the the, the real geniuses that fit into those areas yeah. get excited about this because they're I mean let's face the facts I mean one of the most important things that can possibly happen to every taxpayer in this town is that we properly develop and enrich our town yeah. Okay. I mean, so that we're optimizing, yeah. you know, every square inch of what's going on without wrecking our town at yeah. the same time, that we protect the tax base. And, you know, and I think that professionally, the team that Bob has put together with Gene's help is, I mean, think about other areas of town government. We're poised right now 
to do just the things I described. Yeah. As long as we don't, you know, get in each other's way, instead hold hands and skip down the road. I mean, that's what's got to happen here. Yeah. So I think I love the I love what you guys have done here. I just think it's a I I sense it's more of a first cut. Yes. I won't yeah. even call it a rough draft because I think it's no, more absolutely. than that. I mean this. Yeah. Um, and I, I think once you get that thing really refined, and I and I think you know having some doing doing some of that in concert with uh, Gene and Aaron and the rest of the planning staff, you know Julie Andrew, I, I I actually think that kind of a roundtable discussion will refine this thing. Once you got that, I'd get the Chronicle to be doing the spotlight. I would be you know starting a facebook page around this and let's create a little you know fun competition for who's there yeah so that you got the right people there who's uh, done paid job in town yeah. yeah yeah i mean i think as far as next steps i would definitely like to see especially given the issues raised by the staff much more involvement of the town staff in in um, what that relationship will look mm -hmm. like so that mm -hmm. you know they as the staff were the ones that would ultimately be tasked with implementing anything um, are comfortable and aware of where the boundaries are and, and mm -hmm. I did not get the impression that um, anyone on staff would report to any committee because that essentially doesn't happen anywhere Correct. but um, right. I just I want to make sure that's very clear so that it has a more collaborative feel like the permanent building committee right Right, and I, so uh, that's. Yeah, I didn't think that we had sent that message, but obviously that's a concern, so we can clarify it. Absolutely. Great. Um, so we'll look to put you on an agenda in November. Yeah. Could we ask that uh, board members send feedback with their thoughts, not for discussion? Can we get that? Yes. Sent to us. We'll, yes. we'll send it to Bob. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's we, how yeah, we get it. We'll go outbound so, to you first, okay. and then back in that way. Uh, okay. Of course, we also still owe him for the pesticide regulations. So. Uh, yes, thank you for reminding me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've uh, heard from a couple. Yeah. Uh, from the public? Hey, that's uh, quite flimmed on any green street. I just want to echo what John said earlier, but you have more up there about the, the committee and the people. And I, I think that ultimately is going to be key to what we have here is finding the, the right people that expertise the program there. For one suggestion, I mean, I, I know you've you got more to do and more towns to look into, but I, I think, you know, different from what John said, I, I think you want to profile and recruit um, in yeah. a way. You know, I think you want to look at the other, other towns that are doing this and see who they have on the committees and what's making that successful. Mm. Yeah. And, and set really a profile good, yeah. for what we want here and, and seek out the people in the town that, that we think have that skill set. Um, because I, I think that's really important. I, I just a, a little bit different approach from a, 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 a competition standpoint, but, but really trying to, to recruit who we think is the best fit to help this community. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, speaking of holding hands and running down the street together, um, I, I guess I'm just wondering, like, how you envision this committee partnering or working with, um, you know, whatever kind of downtown organization we end up with after we continue and go through this this process that we're undertaking right now with Reimagine Reading. I see their missions as being uh, very different. I see this being much more strategic, economics, and marketing focused for, for the town. And my, my thinking on downtown is it's strategic, but it's actually a lot more tactical in terms of, of making sure the downtown is thriving. And then, Gene, you had three three words that I wrote down, but I don't have them. Sorry. Um, so that it, that's, again, very downtown focused, and I have no issue with downtown expanding. That sounds great. But this is, how do you market the town? Almost period, end of story. That's its mission. And, and the, the people who are on this group are commercial real estate, development, marketing, retail. Uh, I think those are the folks who hopefully can come in and say, here, here are the kinds of things that you need to do to be successful. That sounds to me a lot like, our, if I remember correctly, the job description for our economic development director. So I just, as we, as as you, I, I would hope that the next step is talking to her, <laughs> because yes. because I I, I want to make sure that 
we set up our new economic development director for success and that the people who we recruit who are knowledgeable in these areas are supplementing and buoying her efforts because that that's literally why we have her here um, so I, yeah. I, I just I want to be mindful of that yeah I think that this this expertise we're looking for commercial real estate development marketing and retail okay. or maybe economics is another word that should be there okay. but yeah point understood yeah. great thank you all right thank you all for staying so late <coughs> good night um, all right next up can rearrange things a little bit Yes. Um, all right, so next up we technically have the reviewing the town manager review uh, four. However, since we have um, council in the audience, I'm gonna, unless there's any objections, I'd like to jump to the select board liquor policy discussion. So, John? Let's do it. You're up. Well, I'm sort of up. I mean, uh -huh. you know, um, what I did, just so you understand, um, you know, Bob sent along, he clipped for me um, a copy of the whole um, section, which really is, it's liquor, it's licenses, it's a lot of things, but, you know, I wanted to stay focused on the liquor for now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, at the last meeting that we had together, I had about 12 bullet points that came from all of you. Um, and so, uh, Avery and I got on the phone and uh, we've corresponded and been on the phone and I kind of laid out each of your concerns along with the concerns I had as well uh -huh. um, and the product of that you saw in a letter from her which kind of highlights what's going on and you know then we've got a, a red line version um, to review as well so I need to shut up and let the professional do what they're, you know, what we pay her to do so well. Um, we did add after it came out. Um, um, it, it triggered something for Ann, which I asked Gibri to, you know, to consider as well. So everybody here got whatever you told me, mm -hmm. um, and then I turned it over to her and got out of the way. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Too. Um, yeah, uh, John did, was a great summary. Uh, I can go through the major changes that you'll see, um, and then I also answered some comments along so I can address that that aren't reflected in this letter. So the first point um, deals with war veteran club licenses. Right now, the policy treats these just as club, club licenses. There's been discussion over the past year and so about distinguishing between club licensees and uh, war veteran club licensees. So that's up for discussion. The board can discuss whether that's something that you're interested in, in tackling. Uh, the second change uh, dealt with access and inspections. I guess there were some questions about what type of access uh, the town had to its licensees. It's just beefing up that provision a bit. Um, the third is somewhat significant. The town of Reading charges a issuance fee for its licenses. So if there's a new license issued or annually, they'll pay what $3,200, whatever the case may be for that license. But there's no fee associated with the actual application itself. And so many communities charge you know, a small fee, the amount that it takes the town, you know, cost the town to review it, legal review, internal review, um, et cetera. So if you're interested in doing that, you could build that into your policy. Is that like $200 kind of? Yeah, so the town needs to think about how much it costs them. So it's different for every community, but you usually see anywhere between about a hundred to three hundred dollars for a new application and it's a lot lower for a change of manager or you know uh, change of hours something that doesn't really require as much intensive review um, and the fourth one is what was triggered through the prior hearings we changed the alcohol management and server chain training provision now um, They'll have to file, the licensee will have to keep on file updated TIP certification. Mm -hmm. um, so that's in there. One of the biggest things was that, you know, there was a lot of discussion between John and I about how quickly does this certificate need to be filed with the town. And John really felt like it should be done within seven days. 
you know, I reviewed other communities. I wasn't able to find any community that had that short of a time period. Doesn't mean it's not justified. Um, it's just something that the board should discuss is how long do we want to give licensees to file those certificates. What did you see from other communities? Most communities, you see 30 days. I did find some communities that were 14 days, um, but the standard is definitely 30 days across the board. Um, but do you think that, I know you checked with a lot of communities on a lot of different things, because mm -hmm. you know we had talked about that, and it's always good to, you know, as a, have as a reference point, yeah. you know, what our peer communities doing, mm -hmm. what neighboring communities doing. I'm just wondering, given the speed that, in this case, for example, yeah. that's an exam on demand. You mm -hmm. have your results. A minute you push the button, mm -hmm. saying I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, you print that yeah. 30 seconds later. I mean, so all of that happens literally on demand, okay? Right. Now, when you start to compare what's going on in other municipalities, mm -hmm. I wonder how many of them have the same antiquated Policies that we have because we haven't touched them for and 25 years. I think we talked years. about this. Right. The standard. Before the internet. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. And I think um, the standard, and John and I talked about this, the standard that your policy will be reviewed under if it's challenged is arbitrary and capricious. So as long as the provision doesn't violate a statute with TIP certification, you don't have to worry about that. There's no state statute that addresses that. You know, you just say, is this reasonable? Kind of, you know, is there thought behind the policy? Did the select board have a reason, a reasonable explanation for adopting it? And so, as John explained, you know, it doesn't take that that long to do these online trainings. It's not that costly for licensees. Um, so there is. You know, I think it would be defensible to adopt a seven-day policy. Um, it's just, it's totally within the board's discretion to make its determination in that case. Just need to make sure whatever you do decide, you have some thought and reason behind it. Bob? Is uh, seven days here calendar days? I, I think we were operating under calendar days because business days for these establishments are, seven are, days are always them. Right. But we can always clarify that. Okay. I can add that to the... They're selling alcohol seven days a week. Mm -hmm. All of them. You know, under arbitrary and capricious, capricious um, it, it seems that this is easily just, I would think, easily justifiable given the case that we just had. Um, and uh, also from a, a public health and safety point of view. Um, yeah, and I think the, the only thing we might need to look at the exact language you, we're utilizing, but a lot of employers, especially restaurants, will hire temporarily. You know, you'll be on probation for your first 14 days. And so the question is, when are you really an employee? Um, are You know, you might not even serve during those 14 days. You'll be shadowing during those 14 days. So, um, you know, that's one thought that I would anticipate hearing from uh, licensees if they come to the public hearing um, in October. How do we split the difference? And do, if, if 14 and 30 is what we're saying, town hall's only open four days a week. Yeah, I was thinking seven mm -hmm. might be true. The internet's open 24-7. Yes, but town hall <laughs> isn't. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, you, I guess what I'm saying is that if I, if I take a TIPS training, I do it on demand, I push the button, I get my results, um, I now push the next button and it prints my results, I then push the next button and I scan it and send it to town hall, it's here. And, and you know, nothing has to be open for that. I mean, that, you know. Do, they, do people submit it in hard copy or via email? Right now, they mostly come in by hard copy because we ask for them when we go in and do our inspections. We ask for copies of everyone's tips training mm -hmm. in December. So I guess my question was going to be if, say, someone gets hired in the middle of the year now, is there a time frame for when they have to give that to like our office? Yeah. Glad you asked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't mind getting it emailed because I can just print it out in right. my air file, mm -hmm. but I guess... Yeah, and again, all this is subject to you know the board's discussion and can be changed. But the way it's currently drafted is that there shall be an unexpired certificate of program completion for each person subject to this section on file with the select boards at all times. So that means that if their if their certificate is going to expire at the end of June, they might want to take the training, you know, the beginning of June, just to make sure that there's 
there's no issue there. And that for new employees, the certificates must be filed within nine days of hiring. That gives them seven days to take it and a little bit of time to, to file it. Um, obviously, if the board wants to change any of those dates, you know, you can you do said so. There may be a case where employees are sort of when he's on probation, but sort of, they're not, they may not be full employees for 14 days. Um, that would be my only sort of sticking point, mm -hmm. uh, because then if they have to pay for that certification that they someone, for someone that they decide not to keep, that's an unfair expense. It's a cost to doing business, it's yeah, 40 but bucks. the flip side is, if they're going to be allowed to serve, why shouldn't they be certified? Well, oh, absolutely, but if yeah, they're either. not serving, if they're following if it, they're no shadowing, they're, right, right. they're not going to serve And they're anybody. not taking the licenses and, you know, they're, they're, in, they're in training, shall we say. Yeah. Um, I, I want to strike a balance here between, I agree we need to have these um, on hand and filed and not presenting an undue burden to businesses. What we can't forget here, and this is really important, is that what these people are doing for a living is serving alcohol mm -hmm. to people that are going to go get in their car and drive. And so how they do that is really important. And, you know, we learned in, in the last go-around last month or whatever it was six weeks ago that we, we had somebody who we can we can agree to disagree whether we violated our policy or not. Let's not revisit. No. We won't revisit. Um, what, but he was actually able to dodge the bullet, mm -hmm. you know, because he was between the 30-day window, yet he was well, he, busy there, serving minors. There is no 30-day window, right? I mean... There was, there was. That's how he got away with it. Oh, with the right okay. with the with the you know with being held accountable by this board for violating our policy. So I, I'll say I'm comfortable with the 14 days. Seven seems tight to me. 14. I, I'm not sure what the difference between seven and 14 is, but seven. I know this. <laughs> okay, well we could be sorry, we can be sorry. flipping about it. <laughs> I will tell you this, John. I think she no, knows. no, this is really important. I know, to I know me. it is, I and I want to make something very clear. This is not between 7 and 14. This is a kid getting in the car and putting it around a telephone pole. And I do not want another liquor store owner in this town to, you know, to plead that they got found a way around our policy. That's what I'm interested in. I understand that, John. And I understand the severity of the situation. However, we as a board need to strike a balance. So... I I do understand that. I and I, you know I ran a business most of my life, and I know that there's a cost of doing business, yeah. and I also know that there's something called reasonability with regulation, and I get all that. So, John, I think you and I have spoken both on this subject. I'd be interested in hearing from the other members of the board on particularly this item because we have other sections that need to be addressed if we are planning on having a hearing in our next meeting. I. I I don't think you need 14 days, and I, I saw the seven here. The other comment I wanted to suggest we put in is to make it clear that um, until you are certified, you cannot legally serve or sell. And if you do, I think you've written it in here, every, um, then it is on the manager who is held liable for a violation. I would agree with that. So that it's, I think the point is, look, you need to be certified before you serve. Right, and there's not a, a way that you can play around on a temporary employee. If you're going to serve, you're going to be certified. And if we don't have it on, on file, you're not certified as far as we're concerned. Okay, so just, uh, just to clarify, if you're hired, even if you're within that seven-day window, if you're serving, or you're not allowed to serve until you get your certification, even, is that how we're going to do it in that seven-day window? Let's we'll turn that back to the question. <laughs> yeah. So the point of the seven-day thing was to say, look, um, if you're not serving for some period of time, maybe that's that's wiggling. But if you're serving, the moment you're serving, why wouldn't you have to be certified? Okay. That's, so a, that's a good question. We can draft it that way. It's not currently drafted that way. The way it's currently drafted is you have this seven-day period yeah. to 
you know, get certified, you're allowed to sell. You can shadow and bring beers over and, and whatever. Um, so we can we can draft it the way that you're asking for. We can definitely do that. I think in terms of the, the, the standard, you know, the not be capricious. Mm -hmm. We're being very clear why mm -hmm. and what. And it's also, it's 40 bucks and it's instant. It's not an undue burden and it's not an undue amount of time. It's not they have to wait till Monday at 9 a.m. You can do it right now. Okay. I, I would, I'm not sure why we need to give any wiggle room. So I think, can I just have one more thing? Sorry, please just, go ahead, Mark. If there's going to be this notion of temporary employees are not really an employee, how do we how do we tighten that down? I know part of it is to say if you're serving, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're a full-time employee, a part-time employee, an occasional employee, yeah. I just want it. that was something that I found to be very unclear, and it would mm -hmm. be great to make it clear. If you're there and, mm -hmm. and getting paid or not, frankly, if you're there and you're serving, you need to be certified. Otherwise, you're in violation of our policy. Okay, we cannot. I can update the policy to reflect that. It doesn't that make make sense that if, if to expect the servers to be certified when they serve? Yes. 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 I agree. I agree. Um, I think that the major change here, more than um, getting certified within seven days of hire, is the having to file it within seven days. Because currently, my understanding is that um, licensees file at the annual renewal. That's that is when the town has been in receipt. So that's a that's a major change from yearly to every employee within seven days. And so I think if we do this, it's going to be very important. And I know there's going we're going to have a public hearing, but it's going to be very important that um, that we uh, we the town educate all of the business owners as to this change because I think that's actually the more significant change. Um, it is the requirement that it be filed within seven days more so than everyone be trained within seven days of hire? I think that's 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 the the, mm -hmm. the change that is biggest and it's going to have the biggest impact and it's going to be easiest to, easiest to violate by um, right. by not having your paperwork in order or just not being entirely thoughtful about your record keeping. And, and I think John and I thought through that a little bit and tried to address it. So what this requires is by the seventh of every month, the license manager must certify to the select board that all persons required to complete the training are in compliance. And so they're going to be providing a list every month. So, you know, to some extent, Caitlin and town staff will be able to track, okay, this person, we don't have this certification on file for this person that you're telling me is able to serve. Um, so there will be some, you know, some internal where they're not on the list that Caitlin has, we can um, as our under, well, can inform our understanding of what. Up another point. So the list of all assistant managers and all employees serving or selling alcohol is, I mean, isn't that already necessary because anyone who's serving has to have the certification in, right? Right, but this will create, so how do we know that they're actually giving us the certification for everyone that's serving? Because it's not like we have their employee list in front of them. That's what this provision would require so, now. So every month they need to confirm who their employees are? Yeah. And what do other towns do? I haven't found anything exactly like this policy. Framingham is known as having one of the more rigorous policies in the state, and Framingham requires something called a server identification card. So you actually have to go to the police department and um, register yourself as a server, and then you wear the server tag on you, or it has to be uh, physically available for inspection on the premises so that any police officer walking through uh, an establishment can see that um, an individual is registered. Um, so they actually have their own training too. Don't they, they do. They have their own training, and they require in-person training for all employees. I, they do give them 30 days, but it's in-person, so it's a little bit different. Um, and I did speak with the town council for Framingham, and she spoke with the police department, the chief there. He says it's working very well. Um, he's happy to speak with a representative of the board or the rep, you know the interim police chief if if he's in, if you're interested. Um, it is a little bit more onerous and there's costs associated with it, but it is working for them. I actually love that idea. I, I really I, did. You consider that? I, well, when we talked about it, yeah, we talked about it. Yeah, you can imagine we talked about mm, a lot of yeah. things. You're seeing that yeah. unfold. Um, 
my initial reaction was, wow, that's pretty cool, because now the police department has a list of everybody that's licensed. Yeah. You got an ID card, and I went, oh, yeah, this is great. Then I tried to bra back into the practical side. Mm -hmm. I tried to be, you know, a restaurant owner or a, mm -hmm. or a package store owner. And now what you did is you back, you got to get, you have to get an appointment. Yeah. You got to get in there. You got to get to a training. It's there are, it, and it's then and the there's online. costs involved. Yeah. I mean, they, well, it's not small. Not the training. It's aspect. very thorough, but it's not small. Not the training aspect, because I think that's a bit too big of a bite to take. Mm -hmm. But the 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 rest of it, um, you know, they take the training online. They get that, mm -hmm. and then they go. To the police to get their the card. The card. Yeah, I mean, it'd be something that we would want to talk to the interim yeah. chief about. I know in Framingham they're only open on like Tuesday and Thursday for getting mm -hmm. the cards, so it, you know they're it isn't as easy as just walking in. But if in writing it could be, you know, that'd be another consideration. Yeah. I think so. We could I, issue a card if that if that if that is what the the highlight of that is. I mean, we could issue a card. So I think I, I love this idea going forward. Um, I think for in order to close the loophole as soon as possible, mm -hmm. I think we should move forward with these edits, and perhaps it's a broad, it's a secondary conversation about implementing this program because it's going to have implications for the police department. Um, so I, I, I might want to separate the two. I'm comfortable with that. I think it's critical that we get this done at this next hearing. Mm -hmm get our finalized form so that when we meet with each of these folks when they come before us, everything is crystal clear. Here are the expectations. Here's how it's gonna work. Great. Nobody, you no, know, I came in late, nope. And I'm assuming we're gonna invite them, right, Bob? Yeah. To the hearing. So, I mean, so it's yeah. beyond, it's, I, I, it's not just a new requirement beyond, you know, once yearly you file and now with every new employee, um, within seven days, but it's also a monthly report. So yes. just yeah. we need to make that very clear to we would need to make, yeah. need to make that very clear. To and I think um, a rec I mean my, one of my, our recommendations that our office would make is that the policy go into effect, you know, not instantaneously, mm -hmm. but at you know a couple months out, so that okay. Kaylin can start sending the monthly reports, so that they have time to uh, become yeah. acclimated to it. And it happens very quickly. I'm not talking six months. I'm you know talking yeah. two or three, just so it's not okay. You missed it already, you know. So they have some time to understand what the policy is about. Uh, is there? Um, <laughs> from uh, uh, th these are sort of essentially regulations. I know there are policy, mm -hmm. but they're regulations. And if you roll out um, a set of regulations, that is what we have here, mm -hmm. and then educate the businesses. We will. It'll be a long time before we are able to then flip it around and add the badges. So um, I, I think that, that, um, it, that so that'll also be confusing to them because they're going to have to learn this way and then they're going to have to learn the badge way. So I think if we are interested in the badges, we should definitely get the input from the police. Um, and. Uh, I think it's good. I think it's worth waiting for if we really want this badge. Yeah, I think you could let that evolve. In other words, you make these changes, mm. which I think really tighten this up right. very nicely. Mm -hmm. And then we know that there are other things going on that we could do more research on yeah. and let that evolve over time. If we find that these changes that you see in front of you now are getting the job done, maybe we don't have to do the other thing, yeah. you know, but if, if it's not, if we continue to see a problem, yeah. um, or people not reporting, you know, the way that they're supposed to, the beauty of this is it's so automated. Oh, I love that. You know, that so yeah. so let's let's bring it back, because it's about 10.30, and we, we still have some more red lines to go through if we're going to wrap this up. Um, John, I agree with you. I'd be inclined to implement this and see where it goes from there. Yep. If it's getting the job done, we can leave it as is. Um, so, if I'll hand it back to you to go over, can you go yep. over the edits? Mm -hmm. um, so, 
The next edit dealt with the duties uh, around the manager and the assistant manager. I think um, either Andrew or Mark had talked about this. So just kind of beefing it up, explaining what the liability is around being a manager. Um, and then I just had a few comments on some other parts of your policy. So you have um, establishment of written policies. You're requiring licensees to submit policies about you know, their operation, how they're going to prevent diversion to minors. What section are you on? I'm sorry. Yep, so that's section 3.2.2.3. 3.223. And I'm just not sure that that actually occurs. Do they file those written policies? They do. Yeah. And, and they're at their annual renewals. At that's one annual. other thing on the checklist that okay. the, uh, whoever goes out mm -hmm. and does the inspections, they have to provide us with their updated written, written policy. policy. Okay. And does anyone review those policies? Um, yeah, police and me. Police and you. Okay, great. I mean, I can't say that, you know, we say, wait a minute, this one's terrible. Right. Because they're just, it's all their own internal and policies. Okay. Okay, no, I'll file. Okay. And then section 32212 deals with hours of delivery. It says deliveries to licensed establishments shall be made only during business hours and shall be made in a manner so as not to disrupt the neighbors. Um, do we know whether that is being followed? Um, I don't think we've got a complaint. We haven't gotten any complaints. We haven't got complaints. Okay. That's usually okay. the, All right. yeah. the bell so We weather. can leave those alone. I just wanted to, <laughs> to ask some questions. Um, and then lastly, Anne had brought up that we might want some additional, or the board might want some additional guidance on what to do in the case of a violation. And so, oh, did you want to? No. Okay. No. Um, so I looked around to see what other communities are doing, and the vast majority of communities have a policy that's very sort of gives basic guidelines and lets the board discuss you know, what they think is appropriate in a given situation. Other communities do just go into a little bit more detail and I found Framingham's again to be informative. They talk about what are some aggregating factors the board can consider in specific instances and they have a whole list of those. So whether uh, you know, it was a juvenile that uh, that approached it, uh, or, or was you know ju someone that looked very young um, versus someone that may have looked 21. Um, refusal to cooperate in the investigations, multiple sales on the same occasion, the quality of the beverage sold, the staff not being trained. So they have a whole list of these things um, that they can consider. And then in addition, which was very unique, I hadn't seen this anywhere else, is they actually discussed what happens. Um, if the licensee has been in business for a certain period of time. So if the licensee has been in business for one to three years, then uh, with no prior violations, you might knock a day off. If they've been in business for three to 10 years, you'll knock a couple of extra days off it and so forth, all the way up to someone that's been in business for 35 years with no violations. Um, it doesn't specifically discuss holding things in abeyance, but you know it gets up the board, gives the board a little bit more guidance on how to have this discussion about what a penalty should be in a given situation. So I can add some of that in for the next round if the board has any interest in that. Bob? But there's no such thing legally as a statute of limitations. It's really up to the board's policy. What, so do you mean like how long does the board have to br bring a violation? When Not so much as how long do we remember there was a violation. Yeah, no, it's all up to the board, yeah. And so that's, I think what Framingham was trying to address was, you know, if you haven't had a violation in the last five years, we're not really going to look at it. But if you violated within the past one to three years, we are going to look at it more seriously. So what so. happens when a manager's changed, but the business has not changed? How does that factor in? It's not factored into Framingham's policy. If that's something the board cares about, you can definitely bake that, that into your policy. You know, leaving... You know, any policy can have a, a provision that says, you know, these are just guidelines. Right. And so mm -hmm. in, a, in a situation where the managers change, but there was a prior violation, but the new right. management is completely different, you know, you can always consider that factor, even if it's not written into your policy. Yeah. We give you that flexibility. I think it's critical to add those um, things to take under consideration. Mm -hmm because uh, when we were deciding on how, you know, the first offense, second offense, how many days, mm -hmm. uh, that would have been really useful and it would have also um, given the um, person who violated mm -hmm. uh, and, and businesses in town 
it will tell them what factors influence how long you're going to be punished. Mm -hmm. I'm actually on the other side of that one. I really don't think we want to have a list like that. I think that gets much more arbitrary. And how do you weigh each one? And I thought what we had in there was the notion that we can include other factors if we think they're appropriate, and that's what we do. Yeah. That has that worked in the next. past, you know, up in, I mean, over over a longer period of time, Mark, that has worked. Um, the abeyance thing that you've brought up, Ann, is kind of an interesting tool. You know, we... Don't mess, you know, it's really sensible to yeah, it's like, don't mess up again. Yeah. yeah. And how long it lasts. Yeah. I mean, you know, and you, you actually, I thought, did a good job of clarifying your remark, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the minutes when mm -hmm. you sent mm -hmm. that along, too. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things we that happened when we issued the longest suspension in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the offending party served the longest but then was fortified by the ABCC on another 40 days. Um, and that was held in abeyance, essentially on probation. Do you know there's never been another violation from that place? Uh, you know, that was material, and it, and it was done with the abeyance thing. I think that's something for us to consider as we go along. Um, I, I think that, I don't know if that gets written into the policy somehow, that that we use that as one of our tools. Perhaps you know, the, we don't include it in policy because they're guidelines as opposed to policy. That's Mark's point, but I think maybe it's something that can be held in reserve by town staff for when the next issue comes up from a best practices perspective for the board in an onboarding policy manual. Ah. <laughs> Intent. Uh, I, I, just because otherwise, you know, if we include best practices for every item that we need to adjudicate, the, the policies are going to get unwieldy. I, I don't mean to say that. What I'm worried about is uh, this board behaves this way on a violation, and next board behaves much, much more punitively or much more lax than we are. And that could be interpreted as arbitrary and capricious. Look, you don't have any guidelines on this. Nothing. Uh, but even so the guidelines we discussed, I don't think would have put, would have weighted the different factors. I, I do. I, I'm sorry. The guidelines we were discussing wouldn't mm -hmm. have put any weight towards different factors. Like this, if this factor wasn't appeared, then that would add an extra day. We, like, I don't think that's what we were, were no, talking I, about. So I, I think there still would be the risk that future okay. boards would. Yeah. But I, I, I do agree with you, Andy, that uh, to the, the main point and conclusion that I, I would have found some additional guidance helpful when we were trying. I felt like we were trying to uh, we, we, I think we all shared the same goals of wanting to send a message and also not wanting to put the business owner out of business. Um, but we didn't know what how that translated, um, or, or I wasn't sure how that translated into an actual number. So I, I would have found some additional um, guidelines helpful. So, all right. Where we still have, a, a, I want to be sensitive to time and the fact that we still have many more edits. Um, is the consensus of the board to include or not include the guide, the guidance or the best practices in the policy? Because if it's not going in the policy and it won't be considered in two weeks, then let's table it and set it aside. Well, the policy has has guidance in it. Right, and the guidance High level, yes. Yeah. yeah, and and the guidance that's in your in the policy, the ABCC has reviewed actually your policy, but also many other policies that look just like this and found them found this to be sufficient and to count as reasonable guidance for boards. Mm -hmm. So anything you add is just helpful for you. Um, this is a defensible policy in terms of the ABCC, so to make that clear. I think an onboarding manual could really cover that. I mean, you got to remember, I think... That would that be fine if we want, if we'd like to... Uh, yeah. so You're if, killing me. If we're next <laughs> You're killing me. Right. Well, I think okay. I'm, so, the only, no, yeah. I'm the only person on this board that ever sat into one of those yeah. penalty phases you are. before the other night. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you, you know... So um, bringing it right back to the continued edits, I, have a, I had a question on the veterans yeah. piece, which is that it's added 
on page 141. What's, um, I'm sorry, what's the you, section? Oh, sorry. Um, 323. Three, three, two. So we have this definition of what a war veterans club license is. However, and, and I missed it, I may have missed it, but if we go down to uh, 3.2.1.14 hours of operation, where we classify all of them, are, is the war is the war veterans license the, uh, in the same category as club? So historically, you've treated it similar, to, exactly as a club license. Okay, it's a type of club license. However, there's been just some discussion that there are distinguishing features between a club licensee and a war veteran club licensee. Notably, club licensees include golf clubs, and they may have. Uh, Weddings, they might be more open to appear, they may appear to be more open to the public, even though you have to go in with a gas. So, the hours that apply to a war veteran club might not necessarily apply to a regular club licensee. So, and are there proposed hours um, or other restrictions on operation for a war veterans club? Because I, under 3.2.1.14, there's no suggested language. So I didn't add any hours because I wanted some guidance from the board if this is something the board is interested in doing. Um, I would need some guidance as to what those hours should look like. I mean I'm looking at the club license which is again 3.2.1.14 hours of operation. It's Monday through Saturday 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. Sunday 12 p.m. to 1 a.m. Uh, and then the exceptions is no sh sale shall occur on Christmas Day or the last Monday in May prior to 12 p.m. So, I mean, that that seems like long hours to, to have alcohol available, right? I mean, if... if yeah, but that's what you have in your every place else. Well, and that's why, you know, if, if, war, if the war veterans license would have a different one, what on earth would that look like? 7 a.m. to 3 a.m.? I mean, at that so, point, or? Yeah, I think the discussion that had been brought to the board previously, and I don't want to speak for the residents, was that club licensees, their hours should look more like restaurant licensees, and war veterans ah. um, should be afforded the longer hours because they're typically smaller groups and mm -hmm. just a little hall, um, friends meeting. It doesn't have the same large scale reach that club licensees typically have. So then is there a request here to create the category, both the category and hours, but we're not suggesting changing club license hours at this point? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just saying if the board wants to consider this, this might be a time for the board to consider it. I know it's been brought up previously when the policy has been discussed, so I just wanted to make sure the board was aware. And John, do you recall yes, this discussion? Yes, there was one resident who was at war with Meadowbrook um, who felt that they shouldn't be treated the same as the veterans clubs. Okay, and you know, I mean, I could understand both sides of that argument, to be honest with you. Um, and a, you know, my guess is that it's possible when it's license renewal time, that individual may come back and make that case again, um, because he's done that several times. Um, in the context of having separate licenses, I would be okay with that. Changing the hours, I, I'm kind of not okay with. I mean, you know, the hours, if you create a separate club license versus um, a veterans, you know, club, um, I can't see us extending those hours on the veterans clubs. Any, I think they're generous as they are. I think they, I think the club license that we have mirror pretty closely the restaurant licenses, don't they? So uh, restaurants 11 a.m. Yeah, to 12 a.m. So, so Meadowbrook, um, I know that they just got a new special permit because they had uh, an expansion and their license hours are more similar to re restaurant licenses. That's through the permitting process. I'm not sure what the hours are for yeah. them. Yeah. Rather than through the licensing process itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It came through the permitting process mm -hmm. to do what they wanted to do. So that may have taken care of itself. Mm -hmm. um, 
So maybe we don't need to confuse the issue. Maybe we just leave that one alone. Okay. Uh, the, well. One thing you might can add more veterans club licenses is to make that cost lower. The whole fee thing, I think, it's just needs a to small look. organization. At diminishing, yes. I mean, you know, as a right. as a, as an mm -hmm. we've got. I think we still have two licenses that way, don't yeah. we? Yeah. Yeah, you had um, one closed last year, one not renewed last year. But one, you, the VFW did not renew. Yeah, I think you said two left. That was it. So that leaves us um, the American Legion. Is there somebody else? What's who's the one in the comic book store? That's the VFW. That's VFW. And I think they didn't renew. Really? I think we only have one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Would they renew? maybe I'm just thinking of Meadowbrook because they were all. Mm -hmm. There was three. There was three licenses categorized so together. Meadowbrook, right. the yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And it sounds like Meadowbrook, when they renew, the the hour thing is going to be taken care of by the way it, the That's zoning the permit came in. Right. So I guess maybe we could leave that thing alone. We can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. When we get to the fees, I do hear what you're saying, Bob, that we may want to, you know, um, I, I don't think we should have a reduced fee for Meadowbrook. I think, you know, yeah. they're a going concern, expanding concern. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that we do one for the American Legion that is... So if we want to do that, do we have to separate them now? Yeah, and I, I mean, it's not actually a bad idea to have them separated anyways, just to define, make it clear that war veteran licenses are a different type of license under the state statute, and they're treated differently. Um, but that, for all other purposes of your rules and regulations, you treat them the same as well. We can right. pull it out for the fee section or those yeah. specific areas where it might be needed. Can you make those adjustments mm -hmm. for us? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I want to... Um, echo what Bob said about their the fees for these veterans clubs now maybe we only have one maybe in the future we have another one open up but um, th this is kind of a special category this is not a country club this is right. not a restaurant these are people who served in the military um, and um, they gather in small groups and they gather in small groups and and I think that um, for someone who's never served in the military, um, I feel a little uncomfortable uh, having them pay such a fee. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Let's incorporate some language. Okay. So uh, that we can to separate it, and then Bob, uh, perhaps you can weigh in on what a reasonable fee may be. I have to say, if I throw out a number, it's going to be. We have to do research. Here. What was that? Oh, okay. We have to do some research. Okay. And one thing to note too, war veteran club licenses don't count against your quota, so yeah. there is a flexibility there. Yeah. That's club licenses do count against your quota. Yeah. Okay. Can I shift us to um, three two plus two eight? The manager, assistant manager, with the uh, large write-up. Mm -hmm. I noted a point five which is responsibility of the manager immediately reporting to the police department all instances of attempt to purchase or procurement of service of alcoholic beverages by minors, including attempts to gain access. Um, is that standard in other communities? Is it doable? Um, it is standard in some other policies. Um, I haven't spoke with any police departments about how frequently they actually get reports. We yeah. can do that research if you are interested in it. Um, but this is a provision that you do see with some frequency. I think the whole goal with this policy is to uh, reduce youth access of youth mm -hmm. to alcohol and, and that's why I like this I, I like and I like the badges because it's more of a police it, it, it's very clear the police are involved to everybody the kids the people who are selling it and that has a that has a better a little more gravitas to it than than I think um, what we had before and, and I still put in the pitch for the badges, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, okay. bend there, to the will of one more. Uh, okay. 3.2.2.8. Say that again. 3.2.2. Oh, sorry, sorry. Wrong one. 3.2.4.2. 3.2.4.2. Okay. 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 Which is page 3 12 on the bottom. Is it a standard that people lay out four offenses in four categories? That's the table, yeah. Uh, the table. 
Yeah, we, it, it, is it is typical to see okay. four, yeah. Yeah, because I just was wondering if, if you know, most everything else is set up on yeah. this call now. I, I can think of two communities off the top of my head that the third offense is a uh, show cause hearing for a license revocation. Um, but again, this is really within the board's discretion. If you want to change what penalties are associated with which offenses, we can discuss that. Is it within our purview at the third offense, even though it would be structured this mm -hmm. way, to question if they're operating in the public interest? Always, of course. And that's why we have the language in the policy that says this is just a guide. So, so we have suggested. that power. Yep. We have that power. You have that power. So the 90-day suspension was a third offense. Right. Understood. Got it. Sort Got of it. blatant, though, wasn't it? I remember correctly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you. So no are there <laughs> any other comments or questions to the proposed edits? Because bear in mind that this will be posted for a hearing for review in two, two weeks, three weeks' time. Three weeks. So if you have changes, we should, for from us, the board, before we un unveil, unveil this to the public and to the license holders who are going to be invited to our next meeting, yeah. um, that we iron out any concerns, questions, or changes that we want tonight. I just think it's important to point out that Avria did a nice job of cleaning up the yeah. gender language on the naming, mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. that was all done as well. Um, and I specifically said to her, let's not go crazy with this. Is a, this is a long yeah, policy yeah, um, and to limit it, you know, as much as possible to, you know, to the liquor issues for now. Because I don't think we're ultimately done with this. I think, you know, as we've all talked about, all of this stuff needs work. But. The last thing that I think I might need some guidance on is uh, whether the board has any interest in charging application fees. I can work with Caitlin and Bob on figuring out what those fees would look like for, for writing. Um. Actually, just yesterday I got an email from Wakefield who's doing a fee study, and she said she would send me her results. Um, Ooh, that's back. awesome. And one of the questions was an application fee, and when I sent her ours back, she was very surprised that we had no. I was fee. I was shocked. I I found that out in our discussion. So she um, said she would send me back the it. results from. She only picked I think like five towns, but they were like Lexington, Burlington, Saugus. Couple bigger places, but this will be. Um, we can still look at. Do you know when she anticipates returning that? She said soon. They're going to be <coughs> meeting with an article to change their fees, so they're doing that. I'm just questioning because if we put it in here for the public hearing, then that amount needs to be included in the next week. Within the next, yeah. Yeah, I um, think we should be charging fees for the for the our expenses. Yes. You know, I'm I not trying to. I'm not trying to right. hold up the I businesses. I, I just. All of the things mentioned mm -hmm. cost money. Right, of course. Yeah. And if you said it's in a one hundred to three hundred dollar range, based on other communities, that's two hundred. I picked three. So Bob, two hundred. Two hundred, yeah. right in the middle. Yeah. Uh, I so, so Bob, can you, based off I'll of ask the that's true? Okay. Yeah, it's probably not been adjusted for can inflation. Can we can we leave that up to Bob after he does a sort of an assessment of and, and Caitlin an assessment of how, no, much, how, how much is this cost yeah. to take? Yeah. We're, we're looking I, yeah. to you. So whatever amount you include, okay. I think we'll. Feel comfortable with. And I'll, I'll make that over inclusive, meaning that I'll include all the types of applications. The board, in its discretion, can choose. That's you know, perfect. some are too minor, we'll cut them. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, all right. So, any other edits to this before we move on? I do have one question. Three two two one two, page three dash six, application for a new license. It says, in addition to the renewal application form, they provide proof insurance, certificate of completed awareness training, and any additional information the select board shall request. When and how do we make clear what we're looking for? So in other communities that have this, they would notify staff if there's something specific that they were looking for from that licensee, and then they would request it. But if you know that there's something you're always going to want, we should bake that into the policy. Those are really unique situations. So for example, if a licensee had um, violated, you might be keeping, you might have a different filing requirement with that specific licensee to show that they are you know, following the requirements of whatever order you've issued with them. Okay. And we've already required separately that they send us kind of their policies that they're using to enforce under mm -hmm. separately, so it's not part of this. So this is an above and beyond question. 
Right. And the monthly reports are included separately as well. Yeah, so yeah. I think I'm okay, okay. for now. Okay. I, I just have one more question. Where yeah. I forget where we came out on this. Under 3225, um, towards the end. Um, Give us a second. It's really go to 3226. Yeah, I don't know. That's where I am. Mm -hmm. What page? Uh, 3226. 3-8. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. So, wh where do we come out? You know, I think the board sort of agreed that we'd like them to be certified before they serve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to demonstrate that. So, to, 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 are we going to need to change this language? Yes, this language will change. Okay. Yeah. Because the way it's drafted right now is that they have seven days. They can serve during that seven day period. Right. They just need to be trained by the end of that seven day period. So yeah. this will look very different. Okay, and then, and then we'll trust you to get that right. And then. Mm -hmm. And I can work with um, John. with John and yeah. Anne on that. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great. All right, Ivory, thank you very much for this, yeah. John. Thank you for, yeah. Yeah, for this taking this on. This is a very timely change of policy. All right. Thanks, Debra. Yeah. So, uh, given the hour, I think there is one thing that um, is important to prioritize here over what we have left uh, on the agenda, and that is the town manager review format, mm. because we are already overdue and having completed that, and previous discussions uh, for the, from the board. Last session, we, there was unanimous agreement that the form used to evaluate the town manager was wholly inadequate. <coughs> So, Bob has included, and let me just find out what page it's on. From the March meeting that Andy and Dan had. Yeah. 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 So, all right. This uh, packet is so big. It's just all right. Yeah. I have it in print. Yeah. All right. So, there were, I'm curious, John, as, as the only one who was here in 2015, uh, and Bob, perhaps you can remind us, why was the evaluation form changed from what it was in 2015 to what it is now? Because that one seemed much more appropriate to evaluating a town manager as opposed to a staff member. I don't know what, how others feel about that. Um, it was easier. I think, yeah, and I do think that it, um, I think it migrated because it more closely it matched what, it matched what you were doing yep. with with your staff mm -hmm. and so it was kind of simple yeah and we said okay let's give it a try and then we gave it a try <laughs> nobody liked it nobody liked it <laughs> the other thing takes a little more work but i think it's i, I honestly think it's so much better yeah the, the I, previous one yes yeah i mean i think there are ways you know as i looked through it i think there were something like 30 some odd goals and we've already cut those back to i think 20 now um do we have any volunteers or someone who would like to make edits to this form based off of Bob's current goals? Can I just ask you, is that the form that looks like this sideways? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I'll get yeah, it would have to be document. updated to his current I mean, I, I think if I remember correctly, one of the complaints about this form is that it's more ranking and check boxes and a little less comment and so I think it's important that the comments I think are much more valuable so if we choose this format I think there should be universal understanding that we're not just putting one through well, five you could just build forms whatever. so that it calls for comments well there are they, they there are there are, there are areas it's just comments. it's easy to cheat yeah and this is a blank form just to be clear obviously right um, different board members have different appetites for comments. I seem like I wrote true. a lot. I mean, well, that's not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Um, I think and, and almost all of it was really nice. Because <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a stupid it form. Was, it was a bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, again, do we have a volunteer who can, you know, take a stab at this, present it at the next meeting? If we're all in agreement, we can move forward with the evaluation process. Yeah, I can certainly edit it to be current, if that's what you're asking. That's not any opinions. That's just a fact. Okay. So right. I put in last year's goals. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I'm curious if there's. I know you've all poured over this. So, do you have any? Are there any other edits to the format that stands now? 
It's, it's a little clunky. That's why it should yeah. look sideways, right? Yeah. 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 It's a little yeah. tough. You can, you, yeah. you can rotate it. First, it's a little embarrassing. Well, you really can't. I have to apologize to Bob because mm -hmm. I was on this committee with Dan, mm -hmm. and I knew <laughs> that we should have set up a subcommittee beforehand to develop a new form. Um, but then the summer came, and uh, so I, I do apologize that we didn't. All right. So, Bob, how about if, if you feel comfortable inputting the goals? Yeah. And then we'll take a review at it at our next meeting, put 10 minutes on the agenda, and that's it, because the okay. meetings are starting to get a little packed. Um, and here's my ask of the board. If you have any edits to this document, please send them to Bob. Because if you yeah. don't, and we review this in two weeks' time, and then you have edits, I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's fair enough. I think, uh, I think you know I, this isn't something that should have a lot of it shouldn't have a big air time. Yeah. Exactly, no. we don't need air time on this. Um, so please do send edits to Bob. And while we're at it, please do remember that we have to review the Board of Health pesticide regulations and send any questions to Bob because the Board of Health will be expecting that and they want to put it in front of us again. Can we um, call the board of select and the select board? That's that's my end. <laughs> can is it possible to get this in either word yeah. format or, or so we can, you know, do, do red strike changes? Yeah. track changes? All right. Um, so Bob, if you can send that to all of us. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and I'm going to give us a deadline. What's today? Tuesday. I'm going to give us a deadline until Friday, so that the staff has it. Bob has it back on Monday. And that's it. Cause we're, we're we'll give Bob a day or two to get it out. Yeah, it depends what my deadline is. Oh. How fast <laughs> I can get it to you. <laughs> Our next meeting's three weeks, so there is a little more time. Oh, God. Yeah, so don't, don't tell us that, Bobby. Give us I a know. pitch. I'll get it to you by the end of the week. Thanks, Bob. Um, so when do when are our edits You could send them in by next week. Madam Madam say the of the week. If you get it out by the end of the week and we have it back in like by the following right, week, you know. there's still a week. Right. Exactly. All right, let's go with, so Bob will give it to us by the end of this week. We do it to, we owe it to Bob by the 4th. Okay. Okay, good. That sounds right. excellent. And, and Bob, and not, you will you write that in bold letters and say that we'll have detention if we don't. Yeah, I mean, I think at that point, if you don't, if we don't provide feedback, we forfeit the right. To yes, the yes. Uh, it's I'm going to start calling it anyway. I just love what a clock thing is. <laughs> it is one up. All right. Um, so the items we haven't gotten to are the goal setting priorities discussion, future agenda discussion, uh, and minutes, but we'll have to table those. Now, there were, were there a couple things that we had said we would move to the future agendas discussion? The that, tax classification. So is that important to resolve this evening? If you can. Yeah. I mean... If, if you can't, then we'll do it in P2 pieces. What is left for the um, for the senior tax relief update or, or presentation? Other than just him filling out details. So yeah. He gave me the current year and has to organize the past and then analyze, <laughs> which he hasn't done. Okay. That's, that's easy. And, you know, totally separate is, you know, our getting a new home rule petition. Right. That's there. really, it, it's pertinent but off this discussion mm -hmm. um, so it won't be that won't I don't that think that'll go right. on any it whether it's one or two it's, it's an automatic pilot if yeah you it's just got to get done so, so, yeah. and he's on top of it yeah so. oh yeah yeah totally <laughs> all right I mean I, I think we can split John you had express expressed interest in having either a longer discussion or two discussions with I, I'm actually okay. I just do think we're gonna. It's going to. We have to allocate you, the right of You're time. gonna. You're gonna have an audience. Right. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. We're gonna have the businesses coming because we always um, do. Yeah. You're gonna have an audience. So you're gonna decide how you want to manage that. Just from a meeting management standpoint, is it? It may be better in one. Yeah. Instead of two, just for that reason, but earmark yeah, a little more time. time, possibly. Instead of 45 yeah. minutes, earmark an hour. So, Bob, as I'm looking at this agenda, is it possible to move the depot parking stickers to the 15th so that we can allow the tax classification more time on the 29th? I'll, I'll work on it. Yeah, that's uh, and the depot thing is part of other things going on the 29th, the whole ETTF stuff. So yeah. we'll talk about it though. All right, let's see let's see how we can move it, but let's definitely allocate more time because yep. one thing to note is that 
the liquor policy hearing mm -hmm. is on the 29th? No, the 15th. Uh, 15th. The 15th, and that's also going to go long. Yeah, well, because you, you got it's a hearing, you got to let them we speak. Have to, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we've we've done a lot of talking, though. I mean, we're you know on this topic. Yes. That's why I think the discussion period now. I think our long. discussion period won't be long because we're yeah. essentially in agreement once everybody presents the final. Well, unless part. there's a really strong case, of, 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 right. you know, pointing us out something that we missed. Right. 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 That's the whole point of the public cool. hearing that could happen. Huh? One thing you can consider is moving the discussion with the liquor license holders to the November meeting instead of October. Because if you're going to discuss downtown parking, that could take a long time. Mm -hmm. On the 29th. On the 29th. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a big more meeting. tax classification room as well for that night. So the proposal now is to have Victor come in on the first 29th. meeting. No, on the, the and, October 29th. And, and give us, he, he, we're having him give us a set of different options, like a few options. Well, again, if it's one meeting, it's the 29th, and whatever he gives you as options, you decide that night. Right. So, yeah. Right. Sure. And, and I think the instructions we gave him are to give some general yeah. options, not not a <coughs> 1.0235 split. Um, I'd rather not have that again. Yeah, I don't think we need him to do another 20-page presentation. We've all seen no. it in the past. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to work with you on the agenda. We oh. can figure it out. All right. Um, so we'll allocate more time for tax classification. Yeah. Because you're going to have public comments. So yeah. You, yeah. And you have to. You have to. Allow. Right. I think you have to allow. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so the liquor license holder could potentially move. That's what you guys To November, yeah. 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 yeah, November but, doesn't seem as heavy. Of course, they always fill up, but... That's separate from our hearing, and that's fine. Right. Yeah. Um, that's still plenty of time. Great. So let's um, I, tape. Oh, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Um, I just want to be sure that time doesn't get away with it oh, from us on the whole parking sticker thing. Right. So that, you know, so we can have that discussion mm -hmm. in time yeah. so that in a in a three car family yes. they can add a you know another parking sticker not at a full price you know or at least we should have that discussion yeah the, the police um said that it's okay to wait as long as the 29th but please do it before november because they have to order stickers okay. so that's what i thought yeah. that's People why i'm bringing it up in november I, so. I know it's time sensitive so yeah, october 29th right. is okay and we'll see if we can move it to the 15th yeah I mean, maybe we have to split them up bob but we can yep. figure that out yeah uh, but yes, to your point, John, we won't push yeah, that one further. I don't, I, I don't want it's like tax year to get away on we can't that. do it. Right. Just too much money in people's Vanessa. Yeah. Yes. Um, two quick questions. One, um, a, a concern with the pushing out the comprehensive sustainability plan past November. My only concern is that uh, dis decisions will be made about doing big repairs or. Or do we have any on the horizon that are going to happen before so this can one this can float a little bit is that right coolidge next year there's a boiler that's being replaced okay it's got to be next summer okay. but there's time still um, what you're discussing i think is much more longer term and bigger picture and mm -hmm. not one specific event and that's um, part of the budget discussion for December, but it's really part of the capital plan two, three years from now. Yeah. That's the way it's in the draft plan of FinCom. I, I was hoping for, to, to, to get in into the game. I, I think the sooner we get into this game, yeah. uh, the better off we'll be. But but it sounds like there's nothing imminent. Nothing happening. pressing, no. Yeah, okay. And then the other one, and please don't yell at me, um, does it make sense? And, and I know we plan out the schedule for a year. I think that's fantastic. But um, should we try to squeeze in another meeting in so October, November? To one of the things Bob had mentioned is mm -hmm. we have four meetings scheduled for right. Yo, town meeting. I, I know. Well, you have four December meetings, and they were budget meetings, and the third has now been given to other agenda items. Right. So that's your additional meeting. You could add a November meeting. It's a little tricky with town meeting, not yeah. knowing how long it'll go. Uh, I had forgotten about that. Fourth. Yeah, your meeting on the 19th, the 12th is town meeting, so you can't meet then. Yeah. The 5th is one week after your meeting on the 29th, so you could add a meeting on the 5th. 
Actually, Bob, I retract the, the question because I forgot that okay. for the... I think if we gain the December one, yes. we're in good shape. Okay. Mark. So my comment is that, Bob, you um, chastised us for not having consistent office hours. <laughs> um, I actually have reserved space at the library for the Saturday. If the board thinks it makes sense, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, I appreciate that it's Tuesday and that's on Saturday. What's that time? 9.30. At the, in the history room AM of the library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> AM on this one. In the history room. Okay. Saturday, That's great. 30 AM. All so right, that qualifies as September. Uh, would someone like to volunteer for October office hours in the senior center? October? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, can you coordinate directly with Bob on a date and time sure. so that we can have so that? So we get it posted? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and preferably in the later half of the month so that we can announce it on uh, at our 15th meeting. We'll do it on Halloween and hand it up to you. Thank you, guys. I love it. All right. Uh, we'll um, send stuff out on social media uh, near, near the end of the week, Wednesday, Thursday. That's, that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Yeah, that's tomorrow. Okay. Um, it's almost done. Are we, do we need to decide if we're going to vote individually on warrant articles? Oh. Do we need to decide I, that now? Or? I will put it on your next meeting as an agenda item. It seemed like you wanted to from a prior discussion, but you tell me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sure. It, it probably is not a long discussion. Except for maybe the two-person sponsored article and how you want to come together and write that out. Good time. All right. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Great. Before you leave. No.